November 10th, 2022, we're gathered for this work session to, to discuss the 2022 fall budget monitoring process for the city of Portland. I'd like to hand this off to city budget office director, Jessica Kennard. She'll walk us through the agenda today and kick off the work session. Good to see you again. Again, thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon to you and fellow commissioners and, and to our director of the Office of Equity and Human Rights, Lisa Watson, thank you for being here today. For the record, my name is Jessica Kennard and I am the city's budget director. I'm here today to lead you through our fall budget work session where we will discuss the financial outlook as well as recent and potential future allocations. So commissioners, um, folks that are in person, we have a presentation that we'll be walking through. We will also be pulling up the presentation on the computer shortly, <laughs> as soon as we can get that going. Um, our agenda today is to start with our economist, Peter Holzman, providing a financial outlook presentation. I will then provide a high-level overview of recent investment and performance trends with a particular focus on the five shared priority areas that Council adopted in January of 2021. As our work session is long and with dense topics, we hope to be able to give you a 10-minute break in the middle. Then we will turn to the decisions in front of you with the pending general fund allocation ordinance. I will briefly outline requests for general fund contingency resources from bureaus, and we will spend the bulk of our time discussing draft mayor's proposed investments for the general fund allocation ordinance that is scheduled to come to council next week. So I will now turn the floor over to Peter Holzman, the city economist. So I see. Presentation up. Yeah, there we go. Thank you, Jingri. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Thank you, Director Kennard and Council. For the record, my name is Peter Holzman. My pronouns are he, him, and I am the city economist. The focus of my presentation today is going to be the financial position of the city's general fund, specifically regarding revenues and expenses. Given significant levels of inflation, the growing likelihood of a recession, and the city's reliance on corporate profits, I'm going to begin by talking about the national economy before turning to my attention to the city's finances. Currently, the most pressing economic issue is inflation. Right now, the Federal Reserve is on an aggressive pass, path of raising interest rates to combat this inflation and have expressed willingness to slow the economy enough to cause a recession if needed. This slide shows two measures of the National Consumer Price Index, the traditional measure and the core prices where more volatile components such as food and gas inflation are removed. The left-hand side shows year-over-year -year percent change in inflation, the x-axis is the year, and gray shading represents recessions. A couple of key points stand out on this graph. One, we are currently experiencing the highest level of inflation since the early 1980s. And two, the level of inflation is finally showing signs of beginning to, to turn. This is in part because the federal funds rate has gone from near zero to above 3% since the beginning of the year, which increases borrowing costs, dampens investment, and slows the growth in the price of housing. But it's also because some of the supply side issues have improved. For example, in late 2021, there were over 100 container ships waiting to dock at the ports of Los Angeles, where 30%, 37% of all U.S. imports flow through. As of October uh, 21st, there were four container ships waiting to dock. As an aside, the measure of inflation tied to city contracts is the consumer price index for all urban wage earners in the West region size class A. As of October, this index was 8.2% higher than the year previously meaning there would need to be significant deflation in the last two months to get below the 5% contractual ceiling on cost of living adjustments, or COLA. In other words, it is very likely that the city is facing another year of 5% COLA in fiscal year 2023-24. Mm. This graph shows inflation-adjusted consumer expenditures over time in billions of dollars. This is the main driver of gross domestic product and a good indicator for the demand for goods and services. Despite the high level of inflation, consumer spending has remained resilient. This is in part due to the sizable government support programs through the pandemic. 
Early in the pandemic, as lockdowns were enforced, spending on services such as traveling and eating out declined significantly. This was quickly countered with a significant increase in expenditures on goods, for example, computer hardware and home exercise equipment. Now as we emerge from the pandemic economy, the spending has swung back towards services. Consumers can unleash their pent-up demand for travel, eating out, and all the other services that have been hard to come by over the past couple of years. Throughout all of this, the considerable demand for goods and services has allowed corporations to pass on price increases and increase their profit margins. This ability to raise prices beyond inflation over the past few years has led to record profit, corporate profits. This slide shows before tax corporate profits in billions of dollars over time. As you can see, annualized corporate profits have climbed by just over 47% since the end of 2019. Much of this is due to the sustained spending power combined with the ability to pass on higher prices to consumers, at least in the short term. However, earnings reports across a number of sectors have begun to show declines in profits relative to last year, and one expectation is that as supply chain problems diminish, competition will limit corporations' ability to pass on higher prices, and profit margins across more and more industries will decline. This would also be a key development in the Federal Reserve's fight against inflation. Peter, can you define corporate Profits? Corporate. Corporate, uh, the business is C-Corps. So it's all, uh, yeah, it's it's all private sector. Yeah. Small businesses, medium size, large. Yes. Thank you. So what does expected decline in corporate profits mean for the city's financial forecast? Since last April's forecast already included a substantial decline in business license tax revenues, there is a good chance the business license tax forecast will not need to be reduced further. In other words, at this time, I still anticipate business license tax revenues to come in at or above last April's forecast. The last topic I wanted to discuss with regards to the national economy was the possibility of a recession. Could, could I just yes, ask you a quick absolutely. question? Is there a lag on that then? On uh, corporate profits? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, because of uh, they a lot of times file extended. Do you, don't, you don't anticipate any change between now and the time the budget's adopted? By the end of June, do you anticipate any reduction over the course of the next fiscal year, 22-23? So, I'm sorry, 23-24. To clarify, I would say I expect this year's corporate profits and our business license tax in general to come in lower than last year, Got and it. I expect the year after that to come in lower than last year. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. The last topic I wanted to discuss with regards to the national economy was the possibility of a recession. As I mentioned earlier, the Federal Reserve has expressed a willingness to increase interest, uh, interest rates enough to spur a recession if needed to cool inflation. As of October, two-thirds of the economic forecasters surveyed by the Wall Street Journal now expect a recession within a year. The state economists have described that possibility as a coin flip and are discussing assuming a recession as their baseline in their next forecast, which will be released on November 16th. Can I ask one more question? Absolutely. I'm sorry, but I, I find this interesting. Yeah. So isn't that what the Fed's trying to do? I, I mean, are, are you defining recession as an overcorrection in terms of their uh, debt policy, their interest rate policy, rather? Uh, I, I think the, the, the Fed would ultimately not like to have a recession, but will do it if needed. And um, But they are trying to slow the economy. They're trying Isn't to slow the economy, their yes. overt objective yes, at this particular time. So a recession would be an overcorrection in terms of their interest rate policy. So yes. they're, they're trying to find that balance between lowering the, the inflation but not actually taking us into a more severe slowdown. Is that what you're suggesting? Uh, absolutely. Okay, and, thank you. I just wanted to clarify that. And yeah, I'll, I, I'll get into the other components of it too. Um, the natural question is what does a recession mean? While this recession is anticipated to be much different than the COVID recession, the Great Recession, or even the early 2000s recession, the thought process is that the rapid increase in interest rates and borrowing costs will decrease residential investment, specifically for single family homes, and business investment. Furthermore, the rising value of the dollar combined with a possible global slowdown will reduce net exports. All this leads to declining gross domestic product. It is less clear what the expectations are around consumer expenditures. Consumers still have considerable savings built up compared to pre-pandemic estimates, and demand for services has shown little sign of slowing even in the face of rising costs. This chart on the right is from the Oregon Office of Economic Analysis and shows one forecast for employment with a recession. 
Given the difficult difficulties firms have had in finding employees combined with record corporate profits, one outcome could be that firms eliminate vacancies and accept slightly lower profit margins rather than laying off employees. Regardless, I anticipate corporate, corporate profits to decrease in the next two years with or without a recession. Peter, if we wanted to break it down by industry, do you have that information? Uh, for declines in uh, profits? Yeah, because yeah. we all we've defined it as the private sector, small, medium, and large. Yeah, so uh, in, in terms of large, I can, again, profits are mostly paid by larger businesses. Um, you can look at uh, earnings reports across different in indices, such as the S&P 500, and you can see which sectors have uh, seen declines. And so the biggest declines are in finance. Um, tech has seen large declines. Um, and a, and a number of others. The biggest gainer has been energy, um, and that's the real reason the S&P 500 as a whole has had increased in earnings, but um, we don't have a lot of energy producers in Portland. And probably security. Yeah. To begin the discussion on city finance, finances, I will finish talking about business license tax revenue before moving on to other revenue streams. There's a lot going on in this chart, so I'll take my time orienting you to it. The graph shows how much business license tax revenue was collected over the past two years, as well as 12 weeks into the current fiscal year, the darker dotted line. Note that the x-axis indicates weeks. So the first week uh, includes July 1st of a given year, and the last week includes June 30th. This graph also shows the timeline of forecast releases. The key takeaway is that last fiscal year, over 50% of business license tax revenue came in after, after April 1st. This has become a trend. More and more business license tax revenue has been coming in during tax filing season. However, we cannot assume this trend will continue because if corporate profits come down, as they are expected to, then April receipts would be significantly lower than forecast. This highlights the key difficulty with forecasting business license tax receipts. Even though sizable uh, end of the year tax receipts are included in the forecast, the margin of error is large until April. Ultimately, this is why there can be a significant dif difference between the December and April forecasts. On this slide, I will turn my attention to the other four general fund revenue sources. While business license tax revenue causes the most uncertainty in the forecast due to its volatility and late receipt date, property taxes are the largest revenue source accounting for more than 46% of general fund revenue in the last fiscal year. This is a very stable resource, with Measure 5 and Measure 50 both limiting the amount of taxes able to be collected, as well as providing a considerable buffer to declines in real market values. Utility license fees are the third largest revenue source and have been stable if slow growing over the past decade. The expectation is that increasing rates across both private and public utilities will grow this revenue source in the next five years. Transient lodging taxes and state shared revenue combine for uh, combined account for less than 8% of general fund revenue. State shared revenue is mostly revenue from liquor taxes, with less than $2 million coming from cannabis and cigarette taxes. Note that this can cannabis revenue is separate from the city's cannabis fund. Transient lodging taxes, while not a major revenue stream, are more indicative of Portland's economic performance. The story, at least so far, is that occupancy rates are recovering slowly. But the revenues have slightly exceeded expectations. This is because inflation has significantly increased the price for hotel rooms. While the city's general fund revenues are overall healthy, expenses have become a growing concern. Did First, you say hotel rooms? Yes. So explain that to me, because my understanding was there was a great deal of vacancy in our hotel rooms. It seems to me when there's a lot of supply, you're not in a position to raise your prices. Am I wrong? You're absolutely right. That is the way it was before. And so normally, previously, it would be uh, the, the less vacancies, the more uh, you could spend. Right now, it just doesn't make sense to open a hotel room with the cost of labor unless you are charging a certain rate. And so it kind of creates a uh, floor. Yeah. OK, so basically, uh, we, do, we do have a constrained supply, is what you're saying. Yeah, it, it, okay. it's, I would say that. And I would say it's prices are high for bad reasons. You'd, you'd want them to be high because of a high demand and low vacancies, like you point back, out. Back to the supply side problem. Yes. Okay, got it. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. 
First, as mentioned before, the city is facing a second consecutive year of 5% COLA. This is in conjunction with other inflationary impacts such as capital and material costs. Second, the city has a growing deferred maintenance backlog. Uh, these represent a growing liability in that the more they are deferred, the more expensive they ultimately become. Third, there are a number of ongoing programs funded with one-time resources. Director Kennard will speak to these in her part of the presentation. Finally, the city is facing other future unfunded, unfunded liabilities such as Portland Harbor. Can I ask a clarifying question here? Absolutely. Uh, you draw our attention to a deferred maintenance backlog. Where would I find that in the budget if I were to see evidence of that or look for evidence of us failing to maintain or uh, stuff? So I believe we have a, a, the CAMG or Critical Asset Maintenance Group. I, uh, they did a report in 2019 that uh, goes into more detail about uh, the specific backlog. And okay. I, I can take a stab at that question as well, Commissioner. Um, so uh, I think where we see it most frequently is, unfortunately, when things come forward because they are so urgent, things are falling apart or significant risks to life safety. Um, so you see them in budget requests frequently. Uh, where, as, as Peter mentioned, we also have um, our capital asset management group, managers group, CAMG. Um, they, they produce reports on the, the annual backlog. Um, the last one that was published was a couple of years ago, but they have given presentations to the council recently around our infrastructure maintenance backlog. Um, thank you very much. So where does this leave us? Despite a forecasted decline in business license taxes, revenues are healthy and expected to grow over the life of the forecast. However, given inflation, labor contracts, future liabilities, and the level of deferred maintenance, expenses have become a larger concern to the general fund outlook. I should also note, if we do experience a recession, that would likely increase demands for city services, which is potentially another weight on expenses. Finally, I want to mention that Director Kennard and I spoke with fund managers and finance managers from around the city, and in both general fund and non-general fund bureaus, there were concerns over the ability to hire and retain employees. I don't believe this is new information, but I want to mention it because it came up consistently during meetings about the financial outlook. Over these last few slides, I want to cover Portlander's tax burden, the city's general fund, and Portlander's perception of the general fund's level of funding. Two possible perceptions that Portlanders may have uh, of the city is that one, we are significantly better funded than we were a couple of decades ago, and two, that they are paying significantly more into the general fund. On the first point, in nominal terms, we are better funded, but the story is less clear if you control for both population and inflation. This graph shows real general fund revenue per capita, or to state that another way, this graph shows the amount of general fund received per Portlander controlling for inflation. The trend is that at the beginning of the millennium we're receiving, in 2021 dollars, around $800 per Portlander. This declined in the aftermath of the Great Recession and then grew to roughly $900 per Portlander. In sum, the city is receiving about $100 more per Portlander than we were 20 years ago controlling for inflation. The next question is, how much have Portlanders' tax payments into the general fund grown? I just showed that the city has seen an increase in real per capita revenue in the past two decades. However, not all of this revenue is paid by Portlanders. The business license tax is over 50% paid by national corporations, and considering it is a tax on net income, it is highly unlikely that it is passed on to Portlanders. So if we were trying to determine how much Portlanders pay into the general fund, we would need to exclude at least a portion of business license tax revenues. If you exclude business license tax revenues altogether, you see the light blue line, there has been a slight decline in real general fund revenue per capita in the past 20 years, meaning that the other four revenue sources have not kept up with inflation or population growth. The reality is that the business license tax includes net profits from Portland-owned businesses, so the true line is somewhere between the two. However, given that most of the growth in business license tax receipts has been due to surging corporate profits, it is very likely that the true line has remained relatively flat, as has the amount of real dollars Portlanders are paying into the general fund. Even though the city's general fund is likely not responsible for a significant increase in Portlanders' tax burden, that doesn't mean local taxes have not increased in the past few years. For example, in 2020 alone, there were four new taxes passed. 
the Metro Supportive Housing and Services Tax, the Multnomah County Preschool for All Tax, the Portland Parks Levy, and the Multnomah County Library General Obligation Bond. These taxes just finished their first year of collections last fiscal year. The Metro Supportive Housing Services Tax is a 1% marginal personal income tax on taxable income above 125,000 for individuals and 200,000 for those filing jointly and a 1% business income tax on the net income for businesses with gross receipts above 5 million. The revenue division collected roughly 240 million in revenue for this tax over the prior fiscal year. I should note that Metro covers most of Washington, Clackamas, and Multnomah counties, and it's unclear how much of that 240 million was paid by Portlanders. Do you have the information on where Portland taxpayers are, when you include the total tax burden, where are we nationally in terms of income taxes here in the city of Portland? Uh, it, it depends on how you do that. I recently saw an Ernst & Young report uh, published by uh, Oregon Business and Industry that had us uh, near the top. I don't remember the exact ranking. Um, you could dispute some of the methodology that they used in that report, um, but uh, basically high now, especially with the recent uh, taxes in um, both, both, both those apply to businesses. Uh, and so, yes, high. Two things, could you send me that first of all? Absolutely. And then second of all, when you look at your previous slide and you show, it shows that there is a increase even on the real general fund revenue excluding the BLT, is that because of the taxes that we're talking about in 2020? Because uh, you start to see it go up. No, uh, that has uh, that does not include any of these taxes that we're talking about. Uh, oh. This is just general fund taxes, the five general fund uh, okay. taxes. Yes, not um, the earmarked ones. Yeah, the ones that you you guys have access to. Uh, use. Okay, and just uh, Commissioner uh, Hardesty and Commissioner Rubio, I am watching the hand raise function, but if you want to just jump in too, that's fine. I'll, I'll watch for you, but in case I miss you. Okay, Doug. Okay, I have a quick question too then. Uh, just before you move on to the next thing, um, you mentioned that we are going to anticipate a second year of 5% COLA. Do you anticipate that we might go into a third year of 5% as well, or is it unlikely? Uh, right now, uh, economists' forecast of inflation would not indicate that. Um, it, it would indicate more along the lines of 3%. And to continue this slide, uh, the Multnomah County Preschool for All Tax is a 1.5% tax on taxable income over 125,000 for individuals and a 200,000 for joint filers, and an additional 1.5% tax on income over 250,000 for individuals and 400,000 for joint filers. In its first year, this tax collected roughly 187 million. The Portland Parks Levy is a local option property tax of 80 cents per 1,000 of assessed value and raised roughly 45 million in its first year. Oh, sorry. Finally, the Multnomah County General Obligation Bond is a tax of 0.5951 per 1,000 of assessed value to raise 52.9 million. Despite the lower tax rate, general obligation bonds are not compressed and therefore it had more of an impact on some taxpayers than the Portland Parks Levy. This is just a sample of how Portlanders' tax burden has increased over the past couple of years. Can I ask a quick question? And I recognize that this is an unfair question uh, to ask anyone in this room to answer. Um, but I see the Multnomah County Preschool for All Tax uh, pulled in $187 million in its first year. That's That seems like a, a, a lot of money. Um, do you know, it's not obvious to me where it's been spent. Where are we seeing that money? Uh, I don't know the answer. I do know that they are going to be reporting out sometime this month, I believe, on um, exactly how that program is going. Um, okay, I look forward to reading that report. And also, I, I don't want to neglect our budget advisors. If you guys have comments, questions, oh. thoughts, uh, just jump right in with the rest of us. Show you've never been shy. So, uh, <laughs> Peter, I'm, I'm back on that. Oh, of course. So when you're going over the tax burden of these 2020 taxes, and then we have the graph that doesn't in include those, isn't there a way to figure out how to put them into the equation? I, that was my original intent. intent. Uh, it is very difficult to figure out the, the tax burden of an average Portlander, given property taxes are so different across uh, 
what type of property you own, where you live. There's so many overlapping jurisdictions, and um, I, we don't even know how much of the, uh, the support of housing services tax that uh, Portlanders paid. And so even dispersing that to Portland would be difficult. <laughs> I know. I believe you that it's hard, yet it's also hard to not factor that in. Absolutely. And it's dissatisfying to see this and this, and they don't talk to each other. Yeah, it's and I and I, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it's, you want to weigh in. I don't. I, I can one, okay. one more thing. I, the, to to clarify, the the first part was uh, specifically speaking to our general fund. general fund, right? Yeah, and the reasoning being, um, I, I I think there's a perception around there that the general fund is doing particularly well. No, these are earmarked, yeah. right? Yeah, and these are people that live here that are complaining yep. a lot, and so I'm just trying to figure out how it factors into the visuals. Absolutely. Okay. Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I, I think you made a really good point, and I wanted to not miss, make sure that I didn't miss the point, which is inflation is high because of corporate profits. Um, would you talk a little bit more about the role corporate profits are playing and, uh, and uh, the high cost of living and what the impact that will have on Portlanders? Yeah, um, and I, I'd want to clarify, I, I don't, inflation is high because of supply chain issues and a number of other issues, and it has allowed corporate profits to increase beyond where they are, were previously. I, the, I don't think there, there's an argument about corporate greed that uh, that's changed. Um, from an economist perspective, corporate greed has not changed. It's the same as it always was, which is uh, corporations are perfectly greedy. That's their, uh, their profit maximizing and that's their job. Um, and so uh, I, I think there has been circumstances in the economy such as the supply chain problems that have allowed for record corporate profits um, and has allowed uh, corporations to pass on higher inflation. Um, but I, I wouldn't, I, I, would, I would be hesitant to say the inflation is because of corporate profits, if that makes sense, Commissioner. Uh, and tell me again about uh, the impact on the employees, uh, right? Because especially as we talk about like uh, the hotel industry is a great example. Um, as they come back, they also are not coming back with full service. So they're not hiring staff, they're not paying them a living wage. And so how does that have an impact on uh, the workforce? Yeah, and uh, part and part of that story is that wages have not kept up with everything else. Real wages have fallen, um, and I, I think that is what you're getting at in the, in the sense that yes, yes, uh, yeah, and, and and that's that's a true across a true across a number of industries. And so I uh, thank you for highlighting that. Thank you. Lastly, in regards to Portlanders' perceptions of city funds, I wanted to talk about the trade-off between one-time and ongoing resources. As a reminder, one-time funds are only expected to be available in one fiscal year. Therefore, the best practice in city financial policy is to use these funds on one-time expenses such as capital projects. Ongoing funds, which are anticipated to be available throughout the life of the forecast, are better suited for programs. In short, one-time funds are generally to buy things such as capital projects, not hire people, and ongoing funds are generally for hiring people not to buy things. However, the subtlety can be lost when we communicate to the public. We recently had two budget processes with over 60 million in one time resource available for allocation. And I wanted to put that, in per, into, put that funding into perspective using the language of bonding. According to the city's debt manager, dedicating 4.8 million in ongoing funds to debt repayment over a 20 year period could raise approximately 60 million in one-time capital infrastructure funds at current interest rates. This means, from council's perspective, having 4.8 million in ongoing operationally flexible resources available would be preferable to having 60 million of one-time capital, capital infrastructure funds available, as the ongoing resources could fund the same projects and there would be, still be 4.8 million in ongoing funding available after the 20-year repayment period is over. I want to provide this method of translating ongoing to one-time resources to add context for the public regarding the difficult trade-offs facing council. 
It is apparent that the city has many ongoing needs and one-time resources can only go so far in funding them. And uh, I'll pause here for final questions. All right. Thanks, Peter. All right, so if we can, uh, we're now gonna transition to um, recent investments in performance trends. So, five months ago, Council adopted the fiscal year 22-23 budget. Council undertook the adopted budget process with a forecast of available general fund resources totaling 2.4 million in ongoing general fund and 62.8 million in one-time general fund. We also had 104 million in second tranche federal ARPA resources to allocate. However, the budget that Council ultimately adopted included additional one-time sources such as program carryovers, and this resulted in the passage of an adopted budget that included 247 million in one-time sources. The financial uncertainty caused by the pandemic and the influx of federal relief dollars has resulted in an extraordinary amount of one-time resource over the past two years, a total of $437 million in fact. These dollars have been a lifeline for critical services during a time of great need. Even so, the Budget Office has consistently encouraged the Council and Bureaus to follow city financial policy and ensure that one-time investments are for one-time needs. In the event that one-time dollars are needed to fund operations, our office has advised bureaus and council to plan for the sunsetting of those programs funded with one-time resources in tandem with the sunsetting of the available resource. Next slide, please. As mentioned, the current year's budget includes 247 million in one-time resources. Some of that 247 million has been expended on critical and clear one-time needs. However, millions of dollars have been allocated to fund 166 full-time equivalent positions across several service areas, as shown in this slide. Funding for these positions is set to expire anywhere from seven months to two years from now. Some of these positions may have a funding transition plan and or are intended to sunset. However, a number of these positions are likely to be desired to be funded ongoing. As Peter mentioned in his earlier slides, the most pressing current challenge for the general fund is on the expenditure side with the demand for services and demand for resources. While demand for new and enhanced services remains high, it is worth remembering that we have numerous services currently funded with one-time only resources, which will largely need to end within the next two years. The task of prioritizing limited resources presents a perennial challenge to all elected bodies. In recognition of the need to be collectively focused in the face of several complex and unprecedented challenges, this council came together as a newly seated body in January of 2021 to adopt shared priority areas. Together, 22 months ago, you adopted the shared priority areas of housing and homelessness, community safety, and economic recovery. You also committed to applying two value lenses, equity and climate and sustainability, to your collective work across disciplines. I know that there are other areas of focus that have emerged since then, and in particular, I wanna point out that the mayor has proposed his last budget with an additional priority lens of high performance government, and it has emphasized a focus on the issue of area of livability. As we have a lot of material to cover through today, I'm gonna to spend a few minutes talking about recent investments and performance metrics in each of these five areas that were adopted by council in January of 2021. Each of these issue areas are complex and have received substantial funding and attention from the council over the past 22 months. We are integrating a conversation of investments with performance because for the most part, these issue areas are bigger than what we as a city can tackle on our own. We must not only prioritize our resources among service areas, but we must also prioritize our resources towards those interventions that we know will be the most successful. In order to do this, we must be able to clearly define our goals and then assess the performance story behind our services and programs that aim to address these complex issues. Next slide, please. So let's begin with housing and homeless services. As we all know, homelessness is a complex issue and addressing homelessness requires a multifaceted approach. The city invests in several different programs and services to address homelessness, and for the purposes of summarizing information today, our office has categorized housing and homeless services into the following buckets. Homeowner access and retention, affordable housing, 
rental services, homeless services, street stability and alternative shelter, and the Street Services Coordination Center. Homeless services in this, in this categorization represents funding allocated to the Joint Office of Homeless Services, while the Street Stability and Alternative Shelter category represents city-led alternative shelter initiatives. Since the declaration of the State of Emergency on Housing and Homelessness in October of 2015, the city has invested $1.7 billion in programs along the Affordable Housing and Homeless Services Continuum, as shown on this slide. The largest amount of funding has gone towards affordable multifamily housing, which is shown here in the purple color and has been predominantly funded by voter approved housing bond measures and tax increment financing resources. Funding for homeless services through the Joint Office of Homeless Services represents the next largest allocation in the teal green color, which at the city has been predominantly funded through the general fund. This chart also shows the notable increases in funding for these services beginning in fiscal year 21. Next slide, please. This slide shows decision package allocations to housing and homeless services by the council over the past two years. Since the fall of 2020, the council has allocated over $150 million in general fund and federal resources towards housing and homeless services, with the largest allocation, or $65.7 million, going towards homeless services through the joint office, followed by alternative shelter and streets to stability, which has received $54 million in new investments the past two years. Next slide, please. I hate to just rush past that. Yeah. Without noting it. that it is the primary new pressure on the fiscal situation for That's the right. city of Portland. It, right. it is the equivalent of one of our largest bureaus now, just in the last few years, in terms of what's been required by the city of Portland from our budget. So when you talk about deferred capital maintenance, when you talk about other priorities, um, th th that's part of the reason, at least from the government viewpoint, why this is such an urgent issue. It's eating our budget alive. That's a, that's a great point, Mayor, and that leads to the next slide. So a, next, a natural next question following a summary of investments of this ma magnitude is about results. What have we accomplished with these substantial recent investments? In terms of performance results, it is clear that we are, in fact, doing much more as a result of this investment. By, by the way, I'm sorry to interrupt. Mm -hmm. I want to correct myself. It's much worse than that because that's just the direct investments mm -hmm. into the homeless services continuum. I'm, I'm looking at you know, our firefighters sitting here. I'm thinking uh, about uh, our transportation folks, thinking about the police bureau, thinking about some of the livability uh, issues through OMF. Uh, I'm thinking about our 911 call system, the BOIC system. Yeah. Um, these costs are actually much, much more substantial than just what we're reflecting in the direct budget towards homelessness. That's absolutely right, Mayor. And we have been challenged in the past when we've been asked to compile how much the city spends on homeless services because, in fact, it touches the majority of our bureaus in some way. So that's a good clarification. We are just talking about the direct expenditures right now related to homeless services and housing. So in terms of performance results, as I mentioned, it's clear that when it comes to direct services, we are doing much more with our investments. So as evidence on this slide, I'm not gonna walk through all of these, but we are in total serving a record number of people across the housing and homeless services continuum over the last two years. However, we know that it's hard to reconcile these data points with the level of need we still see on our streets. The measures listed above are all what we refer to as output measures. They tell us how much we are doing. This is a really valuable and important data point, but it only tells us part of the performance story. In order to more comprehensively understand how effective our interventions are and how our services translate to desired outcomes, we need more information. In this issue area, there has generally been a focus on output measures, the number of people provided with different services over the last two years. There are some newer programs that, as they organize and define their services, should be sure to establish a robust suite of measures and data tracking to ensure success. But really what we're looking for are quality and efficiency measures. Quality and efficiency measures are performance measures that tell us how well we are doing our work. 
for homeless services, retention measures, and cost of service measures can help us ensure we are prioritizing resources and interventions that maximize the impact of our limited resources. Quality and efficiency measures can also help us more realistically understand and plan for what is needed to ensure services are successful. So, for example, we need a more clearly articulated and realistic understanding of both the amount and length of funding that is required to support an individual or a household to successfully transition to stable housing. We can't know if we've achieved success if we haven't articulated and agreed upon what we are trying to achieve. The Joint Office was first envisioned in 2015 with a clear goal to reduce the unmet housing need by half and with funding based on modeling of what it would take to achieve this goal by June of 2017. As circumstances have changed significantly since that time, we must clarify our new regional shared outcome measures, working with our regional partners, to meet the needs of different populations. For each service across the continuum, there is a need to look more closely at short, intermediate, and long-term outcomes for different types of services and revisit old modeling about what is needed to help people access and retain housing. Newer services need to be assessed and integrated on the continuum to define what sex look, success, success looks like in a longer term way. So these are recommendations that are not necessarily controversial. I think everybody knows that these are needed. It just takes a lot of work to get there. And that's, I think, can be critical in our path to making impact. Yes. So uh, can you clarify um, how we go about, who's in charge of this? We need better information, and you've identified the information that we need. Yeah. Uh, how do we get this fixed? So I think, as, as, as I think we know and we've discussed, I think one of the biggest challenges with, um, with this particular issue area is it has to be a coordinated regional response. And so we can do our best as a city to articulate, I think it goes a long way, if we articulate the goals, the, the specific goals that we or our elected body wants to achieve and start there and start approaching our regional partners and say, these are the goals that are really important to us. Let's see if we can get on the same page and define exactly what we're trying to achieve individually as our individual jurisdictions and collectively. So is this about, that was about goal setting. So is this slide about the data we collect or, or the goals that we set? So both. And, and so I think we start, if, if we can start with articulating our goals, I think you can task your, your subject matter experts, your, your analysts, your, um, your, your folks with subject matter knowledge to come up with performance data that are metrics that that will get us to those outcomes and those goals. So do I turn to the budget office and ask you to determine, to figure out um, what, what measures I'm looking for? Do I turn to the Housing Bureau or do I turn to the Joint Office or do I turn to PSU? Well, right now you could turn to me. All right, um, yeah. sure, Ryan, sure. Uh, uh, what do we do here? Well, what we do is we believe what we're reading here that we're really good at doing input measures, um, but we need to do, um, all right, here's an example. So we've had X amount of people that have, were in the earlier C3PO shelters, ones that Hardesty set up, Commissioner Hardesty set up right at the beginning of COVID. Um, we didn't have any data that showed any people moved from those into permanent housing. When those were transitioned into Safe Rest Villages with 24-7 supervision and case managers, there has been a big flow now into permanent housing. That's a good start, that's, that's an outcome, right? But now we have to look two years from now, are they still in permanent housing, are they still stable? And that's what we're working on with the joint office to have better longitudinal data about those kind of outcomes. It's been very hard to get. I'm sure you've been in meetings where you've asked these questions when you're in meetings with the county's joint office and that's what we've been trying to build. And that's why I've been pushing so hard for Built for Zero to actually be actualized within the county's joint office so we can build that type of capacity. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Ryan. And I, and I really appreciate um, everything that you've done to make uh, the space in particular um, data oriented and, and data um, driven. I think if we're gonna meet our goals um, and know where we are in terms of um, uh, meeting those goals. Our, our performance metrics are just fundamental. Um, Commissioner Ryan gave uh, uh, one, one example of data that we might need. I heard the budget office um, give another case study of just knowing how much it costs to 
shelter someone and support them to the point where they can kind of be independent. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to get that data out out of the joint office right now. You know, frankly, I don't know if we have the economists in the room. I'm kind of tempted to turn to the economists and say, can you just give us these metrics? And this is part of your work plan. And if we have to hire another economist to do it, it would be dollars well spent. I think it's it's as a council, we just have to keep building it with our bureau leaders. A good example is when we started doing the permit improvement work. Remember, there were no data sets except for the auditor that would tell us every 10 years we're not doing a very good job. So we wait to hear that every 10 years. So what if, in fact, we actually had data metrics so monthly we could keep track of how things are doing? We don't have to wait for that audit every 10 years. So that's up to the leadership here to keep demanding that from the bureaus and from our partners in other jurisdictions to have current data sets. Uh, I agree, Commissioner Ryan. I think that's it's been pretty hard to build that, right? I, yeah. it, 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 absolutely. And I, I'm, I, and I, I, I pledge to partner with you to, um, to uh, demand um, this important performance metrics data as we go through and build our next round of budgets. If I could add just one thing is I just want to emphasize the importance of disaggregating that data. Um, in the conversations that we have with other jurisdictions, one of the most important things we can do is measure how these are impacting our BIPOC communities, our veterans, our older folks. Um, that's, the, in my opinion and in my role, the most important piece of that data that we need to collect. Spot on. Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you so much, Director Kanad. I, I couldn't agree with you, your last statement more. Um, I wanted to go back to uh, your slide about uh, the one-time funding that is funded ongoing employees. Um, and uh, that's a cliff that's coming soon. And, uh, and, I, and I know you've been consistent in all my time here about warning us about the implications of using one-time uh, funding for ongoing uh, service delivery. And so based on what you know right now, uh, where are we as far as the cliffs that we're about to go over when it comes to all the one-time funding that will be expiring? And what do you see coming down the pike because of that? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, so I will say that there are 166 positions on this on this slide and not all of them are, um, are are part of a financial cliff there are a number of positions there that bureaus have fully intended to to sunset and or have transition funding for um, when I did a quick scan of the available um, of, of the the packages that have been funded at least in the last couple of years that are set to expire at the end of this year, uh, it looked like there was about $25 million of investments that are set to expire that are funding um, funding positions or, thing, or, or things that, um, uh, that it seemed as though um, were intended to be ongoing. Now, all of those things don't need to be ongoing. Some of those things can be ongoing and can be more of a priority than other things than we're do that we're doing right now. So there are ways to solve for that financial cliff, but I think the first step is just being aware of what those things are and planning for either their sunset or for the other resources that are going to um, be made available to continue those services if they are a priority. Thank you. Okay. If we can um, go to slide 29, I believe it is, or, yep, okay. So we're transitioning now to the priority area of community safety. Within this priority area, council has allocated resources towards both traditional response systems and new response models. For the purposes of this presentation, we are focusing on the substantial new programs that have emerged and grown over the past two years. These investments include funding for alternative response models, such as Portland Street Response, Port Public Safety Support Specialists, and the 311 system, and funding for the new Community Safety Division, which includes funding for unified public safety business operations, as well as new or expanded community safety interventions, such as environmental design and additional gun violence prevention funding. So this chart shows the amount and type of funding allocated in the past two years to different community safety initiatives. Again, this, is a, this list is just a subset of community safety funding that focuses on new programming. 
In addition to what you see on this slide, this council has in the past two years provided notable amounts of one-time funding for police and fire wellness, for various initiatives to support police staffing needs, for funding for 911 call takers, wildland fire pre prevention, Department of Justice settlement initiatives, among other investments in our traditional response system. But looking at this slide, a total of $50.4 million in resources has been invested in these alternative response models, community safety programming, coordination, and unified business operations. Most funding has been allocated to the community safety division, including towards increased violence prevention grants. However, it's worth noting that 5.6 of this total, or the yellow portion, is funding that has been realigned from public safety bureaus to support unified business operations in the field of financial management and timekeeping. I'm sorry, what's CHAT? Community Health Assessment Team. It's a team within the Fire Bureau. Oh, okay. Yeah, they assess and treat um, high needs Thank individuals. <laughs> <laughs> and paid for by Care Oregon, and so not uh, reliant on the general fund for resources to serve community members in their homes. So in terms of performance results related to these investments over the past two years, we're tracking some notable data, including that public safety specialists responded to 12,512 calls last year, saving on average four and a half hours of active patrol officers per officer hours per shift. Portland Street Response responded to 2,949 calls in fiscal year 21-22, and the one-year program evaluation showed that the program reduced calls traditionally responded to by police by 4%. 311 responded to 130,393 calls and emails last year, a 42% increase compared to the year prior. These are all seemingly quite positive output measures. These new response models are taking public safety call workload off of our traditional response bodies, which we know is needed for many reasons. However, as mentioned earlier, output metrics can only tell part of the performance story. It's hard to know from these single data points if these interventions are serving people better or more cost effectively than our traditional response. Next slide, please. These new models, PS3s, Portland Street Response 311, and the CHAT program are all still developing and growing their programs. We don't yet have many years of robust data to make meaningful assessments on the programs, but the good news is that these programs, for the most part, have established performance metrics and data collection plans to track their progress so we can evaluate them once they are fully up and running. The Community Safety Division does not currently have performance metrics in place for the services they provide, but is planning on identifying measures as part of its strategic planning and evaluation work over the next year. In terms of being able to assess how well we do our work, Portland Street Response has the most robust quality and efficiency of service measures. We suggest that PS3 and 311 programs could identify and track more measures on call types and call resolution rates to better assess the quality and efficiency of the services that they provide. However, across the spectrum, we generally need better definition of desired outcomes and better tracking of outcome data um, of our alter alternative response and community safety interventions. As with homeless services, this issue area is one where the amount of resources needed likely will surpass what we are able to accomplish on our own. As a result, it's critical that we understand how the various models work together to maximize outcomes. So within the shared priority area of economic recovery, this involves pr programs and services across multiple bureaus in the city. For the purposes of summarizing recent investments, we have categorized economic recovery investments into the following buckets that you see on this slide. So business and commercial district support, household stabilization, permitting, waste collection and cleanup, workforce development, and real estate development. In the past two years, Council has allocated $68.2 million towards economic recovery services. The majority of this resource went towards business and commercial district support, with $38 million at, towards, that, uh, towards that issue area, as shown on this slide. Next slide, please. So much of the $68 million that has been allocated is still being spent and or performance data is still being collected. But initial results include what you see on this slide. Contractors have picked up over 5.8 million pounds of litter in the last fiscal year. 
Graffiti removal square footage increased 228% from uh, fiscal year 2021 to 2122. 202 businesses have received small business repair grants. $13.8 million have been provided to small business through relief grants. Over 2,300 permits have been issued for the Healthy Business Program, allowing businesses to operate in the public space. Residential and commercial permits processed have increased by 8% and 16% respectively from COVID-19 related lows. And 179 individuals disproportionately economically impacted by COVID-19 have participated in industry specific trainings with employer partners. As again with homeless services, it's clear that recent investments are leading us to do much more work and provide much more assistance to more people. But again, as we know, more needs still exist. Next slide, please. So we have good, but good output data on how much is being done for many of our economic recovery investments. However, in many cases, we don't know the full size of the need. So for example, we know that trash and graffiti are increasing, but we don't have an objective way to measure the full scope of the need currently. One suggestion is to develop a performance measures from 311 call data as a proxy. Another example of this is that we know how many applications we receive for, um, or how, we, I'm sorry, we don't, yes, we, we know how many applications we receive and how much support we've given, but we don't have a good sense of the size of the need for rental, housing, and utility assistance or small business support and job training programs. However, we, do have, we will have data from the 2022 Portland Insights Survey, which is on the streets now, that will help determine if individuals and businesses who express the need for assistance will know about the city's programs. With regards, oh, not yet. <laughs> with regards to how well we're doing our work, the Bureau of Development Services has the best measures with their tracking on permit turnaround times with the permitting task force, and the permitting task force is currently working to enhance those measures with quality of service measures as well. However, we could benefit from better measures tracking the quality and efficiency of services for other programs in the service area, such as workforce development and small business support. So examples of these types of measures could be customer satisfaction and cost of service. And overall, again, we could use more measures to understand outcomes or if anyone is better off as a result of our services. Prosper is planning on collecting outcome data and or conduct focus groups on ARPA allocations and permitting turnaround times are a good outcome measure again for development services. And finally, the Portland Insights Survey also will provide some high level community outcome data that will, will be available to track over time, such as satisfaction with the cleanliness of our public spaces. Next slide, please. So now we're turning to our priority lenses. Equity is foundational to our operation. Wait, pause for a moment. Yes. Um, there's been a theme, and the theme, and, and the fact that you brought up that BDS with the permitting bureaus has the best, and we actually, we've gone from zero to something. It's definitely not letting perfection get in the way of good, because those dashboards really do need to improve. I've been in this conversation now a couple of times, so we say that we need these, but where's the accountability? So I know it's because Commissioner Maps and I insisted on it with the task force, so we were in the meetings to ask for that. But where, where does this go after these kind of meetings? Um, I don't want to be here a year from now and we still don't have any dashboards and we still don't have any accountability. So it, is there, is, are we going to have the, the, the will to say before we make big investments, part of your decision packages could, this is just me thinking out loud with all of you, it's really dangerous, but here it goes. So why don't we think about um, having performance metrics as a part of the decision package before we can approve it? Yeah. Something like that. That's Otherwise, we're just going to, I, I mean, th this can't happen again next year. <laughs> this is almost the same meeting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you articulated it well earlier. I think there's a variety of different models that are used um, around the country when it comes to, to governing with, with data sessions, right? There's city stat was a, yeah. a popular model several years ago. Um, but, but I think it, it, it can start from sort of the direction of an elected body to say, hey, look, we really need this. And then following up, making sure we have established regular meetings where you follow up, you say, okay, what have you done since we've asked The you formula to today to bring a decision package for investment doesn't include that, correct? 
Uh, I'm sorry, say that it, question again. Today, when yes. someone brings a decision package to you for us to decide whether we make that investment of the public funds, it does not include performance metrics as part of that decision-making package. It, it actually does. We do require that everybody that submits a decision package include performance information. What this is more talking about But it's not satisfying based is, on what we're listening is, to today. It's more about sort of the performance logic model. It's, it's the wheel of the, the suite of performance measures that, that you really need to tell you a more comprehensive story about right. how effective we're doing. Or, I mean, how like effective we're Like a foundation being. does to a nonprofit when right. they get a large grant. Right, right. Um, and we do have, um, in, in the budget office, we have been really fortunate to have received some funding from you all um, to build out our performance unit, and we are planning on um, making more offerings available to, to bureaus to help them with their performance measurement and management mm -hmm. um, processes. And so we do plan on, on working with bureaus to improve their, their performance logic model um, over the next couple yeah. of years. We just have to take steps towards that. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if I could add, the exciting thing about that is the possibility for alignment of performance measures across bureaus so that our impacts can be seen more clearly. Yeah, thanks. So, um, so equity, as we know, is foundational to our operations. Equity investments can be both standalone featured allocations and can be integrated into our programs and services by changing not just what we do, but how we do our work. It is impossible in our current budgeting structure to precisely identify all citywide investments in advancing equity. What we're focused on in the next two slides are recent allocation decisions by the council to explicitly further racial and disability equity. We have grouped those recent investments into the above categories. It should be noted that this list is not by any means a comprehensive list of the equity programs and services that we provide, just a list of some of the services that were enhanced with additional funding over the past two years. Next slide, please. So over the past two years, the city's invested approximately $42 million towards equity-related decision packages, and 70% of the investments, or $29.4 million, were focused on efforts to transform outreach and service delivery to the broader community, while 27%, or $11.2 million, focused on transforming our city systems, procedures, culture, and our overall organization. Next slide. With regards to performance results around equity, the city has seen some notable improvements in our measures that track key internal operational processes. So the percent of minority applicants for city jobs has steadily increased and is now at 36%. With the help of our shared equity manager and bureau staff across the city, the budget office assessed the number of equity specific positions across the city. Um, and we define equity specific positions as dedicated staff who explicitly work to advance equity. Those number of staff have increased to approximately 86 positions citywide, which is up from an estimated 28 in fiscal year 2018-19. After dropping in 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic, the percent of black employees in the city has increased above 2019 rates and above the rate of Portland's population. However, it's important to note that black employees remain more represented in casual positions than in regular positions at the city. And finally, the percent of subcontract dollars awarded to and minority women hours worked on city construction contracts has climbed from 43% in fiscal year 2016 17 to 72% in the current fiscal year. No, last fiscal year, 21 22. So we're able to feature the data points on the previous slide because the city has, has good output data, again, the how much are we doing, on key city processes such as human resources and procurement. We're also expecting bureaus will have a wealth of new measures to track with the completion of bureau racial equity plans in 23. However, the city could benefit from a better sense of the full scope of need for, across the city for equity staffing and resources in order to know if our inputs are sufficient to match the need. In terms of measuring how well we're doing our work, a, be a better understanding of employee wellness with consideration to demographics could help us understand employee retention rates and tell a more accurate and meaningful story around employee representation in the city. This is an area that would benefit from having clear outcome goals and metrics, and the Citywide Equity Outcomes and Indicators Project is underway and will help identify population level measures as well as the, the 22, 20, 2022 Portland Insight Survey will also provide outcome level data that will be able to be disaggregated by demographic categories so we may clearly understand disparities in outcomes and sentiment among Portlanders. Next slide, please. So as another priority lens, climate- Jessica, I'm yes. sorry. So the equity investments 
29.4 million went out the door to the community, which I think is great. But is there a through line on what performance measures we had with those investments that go out to the community? If it seems like when I was listening to this, most of the measurements were from the 11.2 million. That's right. Um, so, so I think that the, the um, So when we do granting, if you will, do we have any accountability to how those investments, the ROI on those, just like yesterday when uh, Director Myers was here and we were talking about the investments yep. for our gun safety and we want to make sure we have metrics to track that. Are we doing that with our equity investments? I think it varies by allocation. Uh -huh. Um, some, some allocations um, will set up uh, strong performance metrics uh, for, for the, the grant or the award, um, and others do not. So that's a consistency that we're all looking for, correct? Okay. Okay. So as another priority lens, climate and sustainability investments can refer to both what we do and how we do our work. Many investments in climate work is integrated across bureaus and programs in ways that, again, it's difficult to isolate within our budgeting system. For the purposes of the presentation today, we categorized investments into the above categories of climate mitigation and climate adaptation, which are widely accepted as two major work streams related to climate action. Often when people think of climate change efforts, they think of it as reducing carbon, which is mitigation. However, climate change investments also include investments made to adapt to a world where climate change is happening. Next slide. Typically, local governments tend to focus on climate adaptation strategies because those are the types of investments where local governments have the most direct control and impact. At the City of Portland, we have adopted clear goals, policies, and programs that seek to address both climate adaptation and climate mitigation. So this chart shows a subset of total direct climate and sustainability investments for a handful of bureaus and programs over the past five years. Due to the complexity of the issue area and how it's integrated into programming, the chart does not include funding made in infrastructure bureaus for services such as watershed management, watershed protection, and transportation initiatives, all of which are substantial and important investments in our efforts to address climate change. You can see the substantial increase in funding with the launch of the PCEF program in fiscal year 2021. As of the current year, these programs, have all, these programs collectively have funding totaling nearly 100 million. It's worth noting that this funding does not include changes passed in the fall bump in late October as a result of recognizing prior year ending balance figures predominantly in, in the Portland Clean Energy Fund. The total for the current year is now at 144 million. Next slide, please. In terms of results from these investments, we highlight the following data points from the last fiscal year. So 1,467 trees were planted in priority neighborhoods, which is the highest number since the city started tracking this measure in fiscal year 2016-17. 100% of the city electricity use came from renewable resources. 45% of city fleet sedans are electric or plug-in hybrid. 55% of commercial and residential solid waste is recycled or composted. The percentage reduction in per, per, per person carbon emissions from 1990 levels went from 40% to 45% in fiscal year 2021 to 2021-22. And then the percentage reduction in carbon emissions from city operations, from our operations, from 26-7 levels was 43% and it went to 45% in the most recent, I'm sorry, from fiscal year 2021 to 21-22. So all of those are indicating positive trends. When it comes to centrally tracking our progress on climate and sustainability, we have good goals and good high-level outcome measures, as evidenced by the reduction of carbon metrics on the prior slide. With the data that is reported centrally, we lack other measure types that would tell us how we're doing, how, how much we are doing, rather, and how well we are conducting our interventions. But good news is, is PCEF is currently developing a suite of measures that could greatly assist in our performance tracking needs. We have good quality measures in this issue area, such as the percent of waste that is recycled or composted and the percent of the city fleet that is electric or plug-in hybrid. However, we're, we are still in need of some output measures that tell us how much was done in order to put the scale of the work of those quality measures into perspective. We also need to be able to connect the work that we do to the high-level outcomes that we're seeking. 
Thoughtful efficiency measures can help tell the full story of costs or savings in climate-focused interventions and could potentially help us lower costs while moving to more environmentally sustainable models. Equity-focused quality measures are needed to help tell the story of how well our interventions are working for historically underserved communities who are disproportionately impacted by climate change. These clear connections between the outputs and outcomes are critical when we're trying to affect change on an issue that is as large as carbon reduction. Again, the work that PSEF is undertaking may expand our access to data across the performance spectrum and help us better tie our work to the goals that we hope to achieve. Next slide. Oh, so actually, so I know that was a lot of information. It concludes our brief summary on recent investments and performance, and I want to acknowledge that we could conduct an entire work session on that material, and in fact, and probably an entire work session on each of those topic areas. Um, I, since the focus of today's work session is really on general fund allocations, I didn't feel like we could turn to allocations without first addressing the fact that you all have collectively adopted these, uh, adopted these goals and talk a little bit about how far you've come in the last 22 months. So I wanted to give you that little bit of context. It's not meant to be a fully comprehensive conversation, um, but, uh, but it's a start. And I think we have time now for a 10 minute break. And actually we're ahead of schedule, which is fantastic because I think we're gonna need it later. So if we can take a 10 minute break um, and reconvene. All right, it is 3.15. We will take a break until 3.25. We are in recess. Recording stopped.
All right, thank you, Mayor. Um, so uh, for the second portion of today's work session, we're gonna be talking about uh, general fund allocations. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Is the screen sharing, kick, has it kicked in yet? Perfect. All right, if you go, go ahead and go to the next slide. Next one, perfect. All right, so the work session today aims to preview potential allocations for consideration in the general fund allocation ordinance. This ordinance was filed on a placeholder basis this past Tuesday, November 8th, and is scheduled to be heard, and if there is a unanimous vote, also voted upon, next Thursday, November 17th. This process is new to the budget office, and as we have already adopted the technical bump, and all changes will, all changes will need to be uploaded manually outside of our budget system, so as a result, there's extra work that we'll need to do to make sure that the amendments to the budget are correct, and so we will need all proposed amendments or allocations to come to our office by Tuesday, November 15th, in order to be presented on the 17th. So as part of the fall bump process, bureaus are allowed to submit requests for general fund contingency resources for urgent and unforeseen needs. In early September, bureaus submitted 56 requests for general fund contingency, totaling $37.3 million. This amount is roughly five times what has been requested in the recent past. Next slide, please. When the Budget Office reviews mid-year requests for general fund contingency resources, we evaluate those requests using criteria adopted by the Council and Binding City Financial Policy. This financial policy states that general fund contingency should be appropriated on needs that are urgent and unforeseen. Additionally, the Budget Office evaluates whether a bureau has capacity to absorb the cost of the urgent need within their existing appropriation. Next slide, please. The last point, yes. Can I jump in here? Sure. Um, especially as we turn to the sort of bump decision packages mm -hmm. that we're facing. Um, this year's process is different from um, the processes we've seen in the past. Um, I'm trying to get grounded into what exactly we are doing here. So we met a couple weeks ago, dealt, dealt with the technical bump uh, um, piece. So what exactly are we doing with this next phase? What are these proposals and why are they coming to me now? So typically the fall bump includes also an allocation of general fund contingency resources if council deems it high enough priority to allocate resources at that time. Um, uh, we made a decision to, to include in the bump that we passed a few weeks ago all changes except for allocations of general fund contingency resources with the understanding that council would consider general fund allocations as part of a subsequent ordinance. So we essentially split the typical bump into two parts and we took care of a lot of the technical changes and now council is considering whether or not and to what degree you want to allocate general fund contingency resources towards pri your priorities. So why, are, why don't these proposals that are before us now, why aren't they just part of the next year's regular budget process? Uh, so, and, and that's part of this criteria actually, is, is the, reason why, the reason why we would expect to see a mid-year proposal would be if something is so urgent that it cannot wait until the next next cycle, and it's unforeseen, which means it was not known during the last cycle that we just completed. That's the, exactly the reason for this criteria. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Well, All right. because you just made that eloquent Excuse point. Excuse me. Oh, oh sorry. Go ahead, Krishna Hardesty. I can't uh, see you when you have your hand up. Vine. Um, uh, Director Kennard. <clears throat> Uh, you just made a point about what's typical uh, for the fall bump. Uh, normally, if we have additional uh, general fund resources, uh, half of those are set aside for uh, capital investments, uh, right? Uh, and I know Commissioner Ryan loves hearing me talk about the $4 billion maintenance backlog uh, that PBOT enjoys. Um, so typically, if we have additional general fund, half is set aside uh, for capital improvements. Is that accurate? Yes, and that's actually um, mandated by city financial policy. 50% of one-time resources are set aside for uh, major maintenance. Right, and uh, because we have like failed to do that for several years, uh, I, I, I assume that means that I'll um, 
maintenance backlog has grown and not actually been decreased in any significant way. Uh, the major maintenance backlog has grown. Um, it has grown substantially. Um, I think it has grown even with the allocation of, of our um, capital set aside dollars. However, um, every 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 dollar that is not spent on capital maintenance only only um, ensures that that gap grows. Uh, thank you, Director Kanar. Yeah. I'd like to give a little historical overview as well from my perspective. Um, so my first year, this is now what my fifteenth, twentieth budget cycle, something like that. It's been a lot that we've done together. Um, my first budget was what we would call a traditional year. And the fall bump and the spring bump that year were, as I recall, largely dedicated towards technical adjustments, under expenditures, things like that. And those were the good old days. And then we upheld and, and I actually made a very strong case multiple years in a row for upholding the policy of a 50% capital set aside. And not only that, Director Kennard, we created a new program aimed at getting at the capital, the deferred capital maintenance mm -hmm. backlog, uh, the Build PDX initiative. Mm -hmm. Then the new world came upon us where we are now finding ourselves at the local level experiencing simultaneous, unprecedented, worst case scenarios. COVID, homelessness, gun violence, livability issues. Um, we just had a primer from our city economist talking about the importance of the local economy in terms of being able to fund basic services here at the city of Portland. The existential threat to that stream of revenues in future years is our inability to address these other issues on an urgent basis. Uh, not only that, some of the issues, and you and I had just a mini back and forth there on homelessness, uh, it's a matter of life or death, not, not just the livability and the economy and the viability of the community, but it's a matter of life or death on the streets. And now we've gone from infrastructure and public safety to providing services to help people get off and stay off the streets. Um, so I, I see us in the midst of a crisis management scenario. And so I've made some tough decisions during this proposed fall bump. I will propose that we not adhere to the 50% requirement going towards deferred capital maintenance. And we as a council, you know, that's a policy decision that we will have to make. I'm prepared to make that decision for the second year in a row because I believe these other threats to the community are much greater than the additive value of adding another $15 million to a $4 billion deferred capital maintenance backlog or whatever it happens to be at this, it's some number of billions at this point. Uh, moreover, uh, there are a number of recommendations in here that I would argue are urgent. Um, I'm not sure how unforeseen they are given the, the last couple of years we are, but I would absolutely argue urgency in the case of addressing some of our issues around gun violence, which by the way, I forgot to mention in my series of worst case scenarios, we have record gun violence on our streets. Uh, we have record homelessness on our streets and the public whom we serve are demanding urgent action. And so that's the spirit in which I'm providing the recommended uh, fall bump. It also adds some priorities that, that other commissioners uh, hold dear and think are really important. And uh, I'm taking the word of commissioners on many of those items. Uh, but I just wanted you to know, you know, people are asking legitimate questions about wh what should this process be? What is this process ordinarily? And why does it look different this time? Uh, I wanted you to hear from me in a public environment why it looks different this time. I see a matter of urgency. I see critical issues that need to be addressed. And uh, looking at this narrowly from an economic perspective, if we don't address it, our economic issues are gonna be fundamentally much worse in future years as our tax revenues dry up. That's my perspective. Thank you, Mayor. Any other comments? Okay. All right. 
So the last point, whether a bureau is able to absorb a cost that they are likely to incur, is something that the budget office looks at every supplemental budget with a particular eye towards vacancy rates. This slide shows historical, and, and when I say vacancy rates, I'm referring to authorized positions that are not filled within bureaus. So this slide shows historical vacancy rates from August of 2013 through this past August. This line shows all regular employees across all bureaus. However, we did also look at the data individually within each service area, and every service area across the city has experienced an increase in vacancies in the past two years. So you see that spike. The current high vacancy rate is likely both a result of attrition, or people leaving their jobs, and a result of newly authorized Excuse positions. Excuse me, Director Kanad, are you showing slides that we should be seeing? Yes, Commissioner. Um, it, it looks like it's on the, the, the broadcast. Uh, I'm no longer seeing your slides. Could we, could we email yes. uh, Commissioner Rubio and Commissioner Hersey just, just in case they're not getting it? I'd, I'd like them to be able to follow along on the slide deck. Yeah, I can see the slides. You, can, some you can see the one, uh, Commissioner Rubio, it says vacancy rates at yeah. all-time highs. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah. Okay. Ah, for some reason, I am not. Let's, yes, uh, please email me the slides, and I'll be fine. Yeah, right. we're, we'll, we'll get them over to you right, right away. We're hitting send forthwith. <laughs> and it looks like we're on slide, is that 50? Yeah, uh, yes, it is. Okay, we're on slide 50 of 400, Commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, so the slide that we are looking at shows a line of uh, historical va vacancy rates, and it shows a pre precipitous incline uh, in our vacancy rates growing to 13.8% in the last two years. So the current high vacancy rate is likely both a result of attrition, which is people leaving their jobs, and also a result of newly authorized positions that have not yet been filled or had not yet been filled at least as of August. So regardless of the reason for the vacancy rate, what this tells us is that bureaus are understaffed for the services for which they have received budget authority and, are, and, and for the services that they're expected to provide. This fact holds two major implications for our budget. First, most bureaus are likely to have notable vacancy savings this year. As a result, the budget office made recommendations for many bureaus to absorb the cost of urgent and unforeseen one-time needs. Second, it means that bureaus are going to have a harder time actually accomplishing the services that they have been funded to provide. We saw this in the performance and investment slides earlier and with the amount of funding that has been carried over from the prior year allocation. If we don't have the staff to deploy increased resources, it will take longer to deliver the needed services to the community and funding will also take longer to get out the door. Slide, uh, uh, can I jump in here? Absolutely. Uh, remind us that there were two messages from this this slide. Um, can you briefly summarize what they were again? So the first is that we'd expect bureaus to have underspending, meaning that they have funding in their budget that's not going to be spent because they haven't filled the position. Sure. The second is that we would expect them to not also not spend a lot of their their programmatic resources, not be able to actually accomplish the work that they have been asked to do because they don't have the staff to deploy that work. Okay. So that, they may end up carrying money over as well as part of next year's process to complete the work and the projects that they've been directed to do. Thank you. Oh, you have, you have very much. Um, I think there's at least a, a third implication, which will not be true for every bureau, but will certainly be true for some bureaus. Um, high vacancy rates in places like fire, BOIC, let's say police, means that we have to rely excessively on overtime, and that has its own, um, that's its own vicious cycle. Um, certainly when we get to the regular budget process, I hope that I could see a chart like this, but maybe uh, giving us a feel for how much we are, how much overtime we're burning through, probably by bureau. Um, I would also argue that where we are, Needing to resort to um, especially forced over, over time, that's a clear signal that, um, you know, we have an urgent problem, we have an unforeseen problem, and we have a problem which perhaps, uh, well, we can argue about whether or not a bureau can deal with it within their own budget. Uh, thank you. Hi. So your reasons why the vacancy rate is high, I was listening, and I think uh, your statement at the end, which is basically all bureaus are understaffed at the moment. But I think that it's important to talk about 
that we've had challenges with the infrastructure within our uh, HR department um, to, to get people hired. And so I think for the public record, we need to get that on the table too. I think, and, and this actually, this does also tie back to the earlier slides, which is, um, you know, we've invested over $400 million of one-time resource in the last two years. That is a phenomenal amount of resource. It's part of that we need to either, that money either needs to come through staff or through contracts. And so the pinch points are going to be HR and procurement with getting that money actually expended. And that certainly is what we've seen. And in fact, a lot of the requests that we saw come forward in the fall are related to human resources or procurement services. And I'm not saying that this isn't industry-wide or that any other municipalities aren't having this challenge, um, but I think it's, a, it's honest that we get that out on yeah. the public record. Absolutely. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to briefly walk through the packages that Excuse rose to the- Excuse me, just a second, yes. Director Kanai. Um, I, I did want to stop you for a moment. I think part of the challenge is our wages and benefits are no longer competitive with the private sector. Uh, so would you talk a bit about, and I know that's a human resource issue, um, but that clearly has had an impact on our ability to hire and retain professional staff. Um, over the last few years, and that's only going to get worse as our salaries continue to stagnate. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, so um, I'm going to briefly walk through the packages that rose to the top as meeting criteria of being urgent and unforeseen and requiring, requiring additional contingency resource. Again, this evaluation and recommendation was based upon packages submitted in early September, so I know that the landscape has changed since then. But I did want to discuss at, or make sure that at least the council is aware of these needs as you make your final allocation decision. Before we start here, can I ask a quick clarifying question? Um, can you remind us how many dollars we have, how many bump dollars we have roughly? I assume maybe this will show up, show back up. So but how big is this pot? Yes, so we have uh, 13.85 million in the capital set aside and 16.86 million in unrestricted contingency. It is on slide 53 in your packet. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so the bulk of the funding that the budget office recommended for back in September was for two deferred maintenance projects that would be funded predominantly out of that $13.8 million capital set aside resource. We do not typically allocate capital set-aside resources in the fall, as we have an established and data-driven process involving all infrastructure bureaus to allocate these resources as part of the annual budget development. However, these two projects did garner CBO recommendations. First, because CBO recommended funding the request of $9.22 million for Kirby Fleet maintenance facility replacement, land acquisition, and related cost. This is a facility that has long documented maintenance needs that presents life safety risks to employees. And the CBO recommended funding this because of the urgency behind the need um, of a, to address the failing asset, but also because council um, did also uh, adopt a budget note directing the Bureau to come forward with a plan for the facility's replacement as part of last year's adopted budget. We also recommended $6.5 million for the city's remaining share of an in-progress progress project with Multnomah County to replace the Justice Center's incoming electrical service, risers, and distribution system. City's required contribution to this project is $12 million. We have funded already $5.5 million, and the other $6.5 million will be required to be funded in the near future. Um, so it seemed prudent at that time, again, with the information that we had available, to allocate the resource uh, at this time. So the next two costs on this slide are related uh, Can I ask a quick yeah. question here? Mm -hmm. Let's take, just as a case study, the Justice Center um, project. What's the worst case scenario if we don't fund this? What are we trying to prevent here? So for that project, it's a partnership with the county. Um, they own the building. We have a condo agreement with them. Um, I think that they could not move forward with the uh, with the repair, and um, it's it it could be uh, the electrical system could fail at the jail. What does that mean? Just like no power. I believe a so. fire. No power. No power. Okay, thank you. And the no and power fire, in the jail. That's right. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. The next two costs are related to mandatory payments or programs. 
$185,390 in funded debt management to pay off the city and Peninsula One's drainage district's Levy Ready Columbia loan. This is an outstanding loan that we've been paying off for a few years. We just have a couple of years left. And if we pay off this amount now, it would result in ongoing and one-time savings to the general fund. So it actually frees up some ongoing general fund. And then um, 632, yes. Doesn't that also make insurance rates lower? Um, I would have to follow up on that. I, I will follow up on that. Here. Does Mike know? It's, it's a fairly small amount at this point. For, for the record, Mike said no. Okay. <laughs> All right, and then finally, $632,300 in the Human Resources Bureau to support the completion of a ProTech 17 classification and compensation study as agreed to in the prior bargaining cycle. Our recommendation is for the general fund to pay the cost of the staffing that's needed in BHR to start this work, and the remaining funds that will be needed for consultancy support will be further refined and requested from bureaus that have ProTech employees. Next slide. Um, so additionally, um, I'm just gonna quickly walk through these. Please stop me if you have any questions. Again, this is just for the purposes of um, your information. We also recommended in late September $19,000 for the Bureau of Human Resources for the city's FEMA match requirement for COVID-related program costs, $265,000 to support BHR's job classification and compensation team with much needed capacity to address the significant increase in requests for pay equity reviews and classification and compensation studies, and to complete the redesign of the city's non-represented compensation structure as compression concerns and large overlaps in pay grains are create are creating a challenging recruitment and retention environment. We recommended $377,250 also in BHR for critical administrative support of the payroll system's multi-year migration from their existing software to SAP Employee Central. Recommended $480,000 in the Bureau of Revenue and Financial Services for clean air construction support to ensure that DMWESB firms working on city construction projects are able to meet the January 23 compliance deadline to retrofit non-road diesel equipment we recommend 850,000 in the Reven Bureau of Revenue and Financial Services for a disparity study for an outside consultant to re review disparities in city procurement contracts awarded to minority and women owned construction firms. Recommended $150,859 in Portland Fire and Rescue for implementation of a new inspection program module that will be self-funded once it is launched. $70,000 also in Portland Fire and Rescue for critical data analytical support to help inform next steps of the staffing study. $462,780 in the Bureau of Revenue and Financial Services for a multi-year position to support SAP upgrades, resulting in process improvements, enhanced cybersecurity, and better service to bureaus in the community. $285,000 in the Division of Asset Management for City Hall security improvements. $150,000 in the Office for Community Technology, which is now part of the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, for community broadband mapping, given the equity implications and potential for increased grant revenue for the city. $35,000 in special appropriations based on an updated cost estimate for the statue relocation and storage in the city arts program. $80,000 in the office of, and $80,000 finally in the office of community and civic life for East Portland community office relocation as the costs have significantly exceeded what council allocated for this purpose. So there are, at the end of your packet, there are a number of other requests. Again, bureaus requested a total of over $37 million. There's a number of notable requests in, the, um, in human resources, in emergency management, technology services, um, and uh, um, other uh, community safety initiatives. Um, those are at the end of the, the presentation as supplemental slides. If you have questions about any of them, I do want to make sure that we have enough time, however, to talk about the... Um, the draft proposal from the mayor and other council priorities. So um, I'm not gonna spend time walking through those right now unless you would like to. Just a quick question. The third one, the 377,250 from HR. Yeah. Will that get to the heart of the matter about the customer service challenges for recruitment and onboarding? Um, I, I do not believe so. That is specifically focused on migrating our, we have to migrate our payroll system to make oh, sure that's that all technological. Payroll. Okay. Yeah. So there's nothing in there for HR? There is the funding, there's funding for um, their job classification and compensation team that will help with um, that part of the rec recruitment cycle that, that relates to pay equity um, and salary okay. offers and um, compression issues. 
there is funding for that specific right. issue area. So we started the fiscal year with just over $3 million in our general fund unrestricted contingency account. Adding the, addition, adding the $13.8.5 million to that balance yields a total of $16.86 million in contingency resources that are available for appropriation on urgent one-time current year needs. The recommendations I just walked through draws the balance of capital set aside for Kirby Land Acquisition and the Justice Center. Uh, the recommendations also draw upon available contingency resources to the tune of $14.9 million, leaving $1.9 million for other needs. Uh, this $14.9 million includes, I should note, setting aside a large portion of that is setting aside $9 million for other current year costs, which includes $4 million for charter reform government transition costs. So um, we can talk more about that as well if you have questions given that that did just pass and we are expecting that we will need to appropriate some funding to begin working on that transition. Again, these recommendations were made in late September. Based upon information that was submitted by bureaus in early September, and new information has emerged since that time. Several new investment options are now on the table for consideration, as we will discuss as part of the next section on today's agenda. Okay. So excuse we're going to- Excuse me. Yes. Uh, excuse me, uh, Director Kanad. Uh, we are scheduled to go until four? Until five. Until five. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're gonna turn now to the mayor's draft proposed investments and sources for the general fund allocation ordinance. Additionally, there are a couple of requests from Commissioner Ryan that we will walk through related to housing assistance and ev eviction prevention. And finally, there um, uh, we can have a discussion around potential Cal target adjustments um, as well. So um, before we jump to the, the mayor's list, I just wanna note there are a handful of more technical policy set-aside allocations. These are the only things that right now are included in the filing because they are more technical. They're drawing upon funding that, that has already, council's already approved to be set aside for those purposes. Um, so this includes $89,000 in special appropriations for carryover costs related to the Portland, again, the levy system project, 30, 335000 in the community safety division for contract costs related to um, Beacon or the Behavioral Health Emergency Coordination Center, 670000 to the Portland Bureau of Transportation for costs related to O'Brien Square. That was funding that was appropriated for that purpose last year. So it's being allocated to the Bureau. A million dollars in special appropriations to establish an emergency response fund. Council did appropriate a million dollars to policy set aside. We're moving it to special appropriations so that they can have access to it in the event of an emergency. And $200,000 to the city attorney's office for legal settlement costs um, authorized by council and 129,000 to restore the legal priority reserve to $300,000. So these were all items again that, that you considered um, earlier, but it's just making sure that money gets to where it needs to go. With that, um, I think we will jump to the other spreadsheet and we're gonna be moving for, to, to the, the spreadsheet document that um, if you're in person, you should have underneath your materials. I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. And before we, before we walk through, um, I would like to turn it over to the mayor to um, provide some remarks on um, his proposed investments. Colleagues, as you know, the fall bump monitoring process, also known as the fall bump, is one of three major budgeting processes that the city undergoes each year. In a typical year, the fall bump would focus technical funding adjustments with approximately 50% of the surplus going towards capital set aside to maintain city infrastructure. As you remember last fall, the council adopted to waive capital set aside to address the unprecedented challenges that we were facing and make full use of the extraordinary amount of surplus dollars that we received. This fall, we're continuing to face similar challenges and we're facing them while carrying out a massive overhaul to the structure of our local government. We're doing this work with approximately half the surplus dollars that we received last year which makes how we allocate the funds now all the more critical. My team has worked alongside the city budget office to identify any and all available funding sources. That process required us to reevaluate previously allocated American Rescue Plan dollars, as well as general fund investments and underspending. This budget package opts, once again, to waive capital set aside and reallocates nearly $5 million in ARPA dollars and just under $10 million in general fund investments 
and underspending to support the work ahead of us. Approximately 8 million of the 15 million that this package reallocates were funds initially reserved for the Joint Office of Homeless Services. Our negotiations with the county on this matter are still underway. The $8 million is our initial ask to deal with today's <coughs> budget balancing process, but we are not done with these negotiations. The larger ask is broader, and it includes a variety of requests, including additional funding for designated sanctioned sites, opening all county shelter spaces, request for support on health and human services at sites, and funds to support additional criminal justice investments. I'm going to take a few minutes to talk through my approach to my funding proposal and overview on some of my key proposed investments. I approached my fall bump funding proposal with three pillars in mind. Implementing better governance, supporting day-to-day -day operations, and addressing Portland's <coughs> toughest problems. On Tuesday, Portland's Portlanders voted in favor of Measure 26228, which will completely overhaul the way that the City of Portland is governed. Our work to implement charter change started yesterday, and we have a relatively short time frame to get this overhaul completed. We know that this transition will require significant investment to implement the various pieces of the measure. This funding package allocates $4 million to charter transition to fuel the work of Michael Jordan, our Chief Administrative Officer, as he forms a transition team and various advisory committees to lead the implementation of the change. This funding lays the foundation for the success of this transition so that we can open City Hall with confidence on January 1st, 2025 knowing that we've implemented the governing structure Portlanders voted for this week. Director Kennard will provide additional details on this item as part of her later presentation. While we lay the foundation for a new form of government, we need to continue to support the day-to-day -day operations of our bureaus. All city bureaus rely on the delivery of core services from bureaus within the Office of Management and Finance. Those core service bureaus, the Bureau of Human Resources, and procurement services in particular are in need of support in order to carry out their work on behalf of the city. During the director's retreat at the end of September, our chief procurement officer, Biko Taylor, shared that procurement has worked successfully to address a growing backlog of projects with greater efficiency, though project volume has continued to increase. This package provides one-time funding to support timely processing of the current project backlog and to resolve urgent and emerging requests, including those tied to citywide initiatives such as charter reform and homeless services. The Bureau of Human Resources is experiencing similar service delivery challenges due to staff capacity as well as a need for critical administrative upgrades. As such, this package allocates $927,780 to a variety of needs related to these matters. First, it increases BHR staff capacity to better ensure that they can meet classification, compensation, and pay equity needs on behalf of city bureaus. Secondly, it supports the development of a training for managers and supervisors to better ensure that we have an equitable approach for discussions, tracking, and decision tool related to telework. Finally, it funds SAP upgrades and payrolls multi-year migration from their existing software to SAP Employee Central. All of this work will result, will result in process improvements, enhanced cybersecurity, and better service to bureaus and to the community at large. In addition to supporting transition and day-to-day -day operations, we cannot lose momentum in addressing Portland's toughest problems, homelessness and community safety. On November 3rd, Council passed five resolutions that will save lives and livelihoods for all Portlanders, housed and unhoused. This budget proposal allocates approximately $30 million to the commitments made within those resolutions. It includes funding to conduct a public land evaluation for affordable housing, as well as an assessment of local regulations on housing costs and production. 
It also covers the capital, site preparation, and construction costs, as well as one year of operations for three designated camping sites. These requests are scaled to reflect the remainder of the fiscal year. In addition, it provides expanded capacity for the city's incident command team to systematize management, oversight, and strategy for homeless services and establishes a 50-person navigation team to connect individuals experiencing homelessness with available services in the community. It's no surprise that this work requires a considerable amount of funding. I will continue to ask our federal partners, our governor-elect, leaders within the Metro Regional Government, and the incoming Multnomah County Chair to partner with us and to provide the services and resources needed to do the hard work ahead of us. We will do our part at the City of Portland, but we cannot do it alone. While this package prioritizes our work to address homelessness, it also puts funding towards community safety, economic prosperity, and improved livability throughout the City of Portland. Over the last six months, Prosper Portland has seen an uptick in applications from small businesses who've sustained broken windows, graffiti, damage signage, and more. This budget allocates $2 million for small business repair grants to assist these businesses with repairs and support our community's continued economic recovery. It is a strong statement on the part of this council that we support small business owners and operators in this community and we want them to succeed. Finally, this budget allocates approximately $4 million towards the impact reduction program to continue current levels of cleanup services and puts funding towards the city's public environment management office to support street skate revitalization and retail support work. We've heard Portlanders loudly and clearly. These investments are vital to our success in carrying out the transition work outlined within Measure 26228, continuing to reduce the continued strain on our core services, and addressing the challenges our community is experiencing due to the rampant rates of homelessness and public safety issues in Portland. I will continue to put forward budget packages that support those priorities. I look forward to the discussion today, and with that, I'll turn it back to Director Kennard. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I think if um, we could just please pull up the, um, we have a separate document, it's a, um, a spreadsheet. And colleagues, I'm sorry to interrupt. I have to leave for, what, four minutes? For about four minutes, I need to address a group, and then I will come right back. So I'm turning the gavel, sure. such as it is. It's Great. invisible today. Uh, to Council President Maps, and I'll be right back. Thank you. All right, well, so the first few lines are, are um, realignments, technical realignments, so um, we'll probably be through those when the mayor returns. So um, the first item is a, a, tr a technical transfer. It doesn't, so none of these items require new general fund in this first section. Um, it is a, a transfer of the um, Public Environment Management Office funding to special appropriations to the Central East Side Industrial Coalition for increased graffiti removal. Um, the next item is a transfer also from the um, Public Environment um, Management Office to special appropriations for um, funding for Pacific Northwest College of the Arts in support of economic recovery efforts. It's intended for utilization of arts and cultural events and exhibits to enhance the neighborhood business district's revitalization efforts and expand offerings for returning community-based events. So that's $100,000. Um, the next item is um, within the Bureau of Emergency Management. It's just an amendment to convert uh, funding uh, uh, EMS external materials and services funding into an analyst three position to replace the planning manager that was previously occupied by the newly created chief resilience officer position. The next item is um, a transfer uh, funding would be used for a contractor to engage with subject matter experts and regional stakeholders to design and implement a diversion program focused on removing legal barriers for Portland's homeless population. So I believe this is related to the resolutions that council adopted and funding is being transferred from the Portland Police Bureau to the SSCC within the Office of Management and Finance to accomplish that work. And then finally, um, uh, within um, the Bureau of, within Prosper Portland, um, there is a proposal to realign resources that 
are within that Bureau's budget currently, um, a proposal to realign $2 million of ARPA resource that was originally allocated for small business eviction stabilization and operational support towards instead local small business repair grants. Um, small business stabilization, uh, eviction stabilization support will still retain $2 million in ARPA resources following this transfer. All right, moving to the next sec section. Um, so the first item on this list is that $9 million that I referred to in my summary slides. This is my recommendation for what council retain in contingency and actually some of that funding will now actually be appropriated to the Office of Management and Finance for charter transition work. As I mentioned earlier, there's $4 million um, as part of that $9 million that is sort of earmarked for um, charter transition current year costs. Uh, within the Office of Management and Finance, uh, procurement services has seen a significant increase over projected workload volume since July of 2022. So this package will provide one-time funding for two positions within procurement services to support timely processing of the current backlog and to resolve urgent and emerging requests, including those tied to citywide initiatives such as charter reform and homeless services. Uh, in addition, uh, the request is not just for the limited term positions, but and a request to add $235,000 as a Cal target adjustment so that these positions can be recruited and made ongoing. The next item is within the Bureau of Human Resources as well. Oh, I'm sorry, this is, the, um, this is related to the compensation and classification study that I mentioned. This was part of the, the, what the Bureau requested funding for and CBO recommended funding for. So $632,000 for a required classification and compensation study. Uh, the next item we've also covered, it's the, the repayment of the levy loan. The next item we have also covered, it was a request from HR for classification compensation teamwork related to pay equity and pay structure. The next item is the a telework agreement training. It's $200,000 and this funding will support the development of a training for managers and supervisors to better ensure we have an equitable approach for discussions, tracking, and a decision tool related to telework. And I should say here that um, if you have questions, if any commissioner has questions on any of these items, um, we have um, contacts listed here that we can call up to answer questions. So just jump in if you have a question. Uh, the next item is uh, one that we have already discussed. It's uh, the uh, Employee Central Implementation. This is relating to migrating our payroll system within the um, uh, Bureau of Human Resources. As, as we have already also discussed the next item, which is um, uh, within the Bureau of Revenue and Financial Services, it's implementing our new, um, uh, uh, moving towards implementation of our new accounting system, SAP. And the next item we've also discussed, it's $250,000 for City Hall security improvements. Uh, the next item for the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability is, is a new item. Um, it is an allocation of, of $200,000 uh, to support the creation and implementation of a comprehensive set of regulations for outdoor lighting associated with new construction and remodeling projects via the hiring of one city planner, one associate city planner, and approximately $65,000 in contracts. Next item is a request um, for um, $250,000 for a firefighter memorial within the Portland Fire and Rescue Bureau. This one-time funding will go towards the David Campbell Memorial Association's effort to restore the David Campbell Firefighter Memorial located at Southwest 18th Avenue and West Burnside. I have a question about that one. Um, I'm familiar with this project. Ultimately, I support it, um, but could, Budget staff explain to me how this is urgent, unforeseen, or something that couldn't be absorbed in the Bureau's current budget. Uh, this strikes me as being a classic example of something that should be part of our regular budget process. So, so I should say that the, the but for new items, the budget office hasn't reviewed these. And so um, we don't have a lot of information available to necessarily provide that assessment. What I would say in terms of absorbing it within the budget, um, Portland Fire and Rescue is experiencing very high overtime costs right now. So generally speaking, when we looked at their requests, we knew that absorbing resources, they would have limited capacity to absorb things. Um, with regards to the urgency around this, um, I would have to defer to, um, if, if Derek, I'm not sure if Derek's on the call, he's listed as the contact uh, on the I'm side. happy to okay. respond to that, Director Kennard. Um, the firefighters have been attempting to repair this memorial. If you've seen it, you know how in disrepair it is. 
in my conversations with the mayor, uh, we made a commitment that we would actually uh, make sure that we honored those fallen firefighters and we would do it now. This has been a 12 year project and, uh, and we just have not made the financial commitment. This is a one-time cost and I think it is, it is urgent and necessary. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Hargesty, and um, I am familiar with this particular spot. I support um, getting it cleaned up um, and ready for the 21st century. Um, I'd be happy to take up that question as part of the regular budget process. Uh, however, given the parameters that uh, have been laid out for this part of the bump, um, it strikes me as being an inappropriate request uh, for what we're doing here this week. Uh, carry on. Okay. Well, you certainly get to have your opinion, uh, Commissioner Maps, and I appreciate hearing it. Thank you. Okay. So, turning now, the next two items are related. Um, they are both related to the Albina Vision Trust work. Um, one is for the Bureau of Transportation, the other is for the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. Um, there's a, a $360,000 allocation to the Bureau of Transportation. So as part of the city's work with Albina Vision Trust, this funding would allow PBOT to develop a street grid network concept and identify future transportation projects in support of AVT's long-term vision. This is a time-sensitive request due to the technical design work currently underway as part of ODOT's I-5 Rose Quarter project, which is directly adjacent to the lower Albina area and the impacts that work will have on the Moda Center and other spectator venues in the Rose Quarter. So that's the PBOT item. And then for- I have a question yes. on that. Um, again, um, I, you know, I, I might support this work. I'd like to certainly learn more about it. I really don't understand why it's part of the bump though. This strikes me as being part of the regular business of what PBOT's gonna do, or PBOT does, or frankly, what planning does for the next item. Um, I'll just share that. I don't know if you're, if you have a comment on that, I, I'll take it. I could also appreciate why you might not. I, I, I don't have any additional information on, on this particular item and, and why it might be urgent, but we could, I think that um, Christina is here if you'd sure. like to hear more about the project. Chris, Christina? Christina, do you want to um, provide some context on this? I, I can jump in as well. Uh, so this is Art Pierce from Pivot. Um, so we've been working with Albina Vision and as uh, part of the council allocation, Albina Vision is moving in full speed as well as the Rose Quarter project. And so we feel that this work is timely to uh, really rationalize the connection between the Albina Vision work that's like fully underway and the work with Rose Quarter. And there's just a gap in the overall work program and allocation that may uh, lead us to not being able to sort of fully realize this, this moment in time uh, between these two initiatives. I I have to mention the fact that there are federal dollars that are accessible for reconnecting communities that have been torn apart by previous freeway projects. And the city has made a technical uh, 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 effort in supporting uh, this community vision. Um, and honestly, if we don't do it now, the next opportunity to actually engage with federal dollars specifically developed to reconnect communities, it will be a real missed opportunity. And once again, the city of Portland will say one thing and do something different. Well, if there are some specific deadlines for federal grants that uh, people uh, needs to apply for, uh, I certainly want to support you guys um, in being able to get that paperwork in. Um, I'd like to learn more um, about that because frankly, um, on the, the face of it, it's not obvious to me why this is urgent or unforeseen. Christine I know you've Christine. spent very little time in transportation so far, Commissioner Maps, and I'm sure Piedmont would be happy to give you a full briefing on the necessity of having these resources available to do the pre-work to be accessible for the federal grants that are coming down the pipeline. You do not want to miss this opportunity, and I'm sure they'll be happy to brief you. Uh, I, I look forward to that briefing. I welcome it. And I think we have staff in the room. Does staff want to jump in here? Christina, was there anything else you wanted to add on this? No. Okay. We can move on. Okay. 
Um, and so um, I, I didn't yet read the description of the, the BPS item. So um, for BPS, $145,000 of the funding will allow them to hire a consultant to study the infrastructure and other issues associated with developing public open space on or near the waterfront in the lower Albina Rose Quarter. And BPS will distribute the remaining $40,000 to PHB, BDS, the Water Bureau, and Environmental Services via interagency agreements to fund their staff participation in ongoing conversations with ABT about their vision as well as provide support services. I won't drag everyone through the conversation that I just had, but I think all the criticisms I raised about the PBOT version of this Albina Revision Trust request, I could also apply to uh, planning's request here. Um, again, I might support this. Um, I don't understand why it's part of the, the bump process. This is a really critical, just to jump in here, this is a really critical, um, pivotal piece of planning work that has to, that predates any subsequent bureau work and then work with partners. Um, and Eric's here. Eric, can you chime in here about why planning it right now? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Um, the What Peabot said about the grants is one aspect. The other aspect is the council has funded through the previous budget process um, Albina Vision to, to proceed with their end of, of some of this work. And um, the reason we're doing this through the bump is so that we can be good partners with them during this fiscal year while, the, while they're getting started. Um, if we wait through the regular budget process, we'll be, um, they'll be out ahead of us and we won't be able to be as good a partners to them in that, in that work. <sighs> Was that, Eric, was, was that unforeseen? For, for me, the unforeseen part of this for me was uh, this council made an allocation to Albina Vision to move forward with their work. I'm sure I voted for that. I, what I didn't expect was the second round of asks to fund city bureau projects to support this work too, uh, which is maybe another way of saying, why isn't this um, part of the regular, of planning's regular budget process? Um, well, what are we losing here? And how did this come about? Jump in, Commissioner Maps. Sure. You may remember Albina Vision Trust came to council a few months ago. I do. And asked us to make a commitment. Either we were going to be good partners with them or we were not. This council said yes, we would look for opportunities to partner with them. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. To see if we could realize this vision. And again, uh, you know, it's rare to have these kind of opportunities at the federal level. We have built great regional partnerships and we've built great partnerships at the federal level. And our federal delegation is working hard to get us these resources. If we're not going to invest a few dollars to assist with that effort, um, then we're going to lose that federal support to bring those dollars into Oregon. And we desperately need those transportation dollars. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, clarification, Commissioner Hardesty. Um, I have one last question on this one and then I'll let us move on. Um, what open space are we talking about? Commissioner, this is the, the area between the, um, the arenas and the river, um, riverward of, of Interstate Avenue between Broadway and Steel Bridges. So what's there now? Uh, there's uh, a mix of uh, different private parcels, um, uh, including the parking lot, which is used often to stage uh, events at the arenas. And then there's um, on the south end of this area is the, the Dreyfus facility. On the north end, there's some public right of way that's under Peabot's control near the, near the bridge at the Broadway Bridge. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, the next item down, the last item on this page, is um, $300,000 within um, the Public Environment Management Office for citywide business district parks and neighborhood street and tree lighting. So under the emergency declaration to expedite post-pandemic by coordinating efforts to clean public spaces, the city's Public Environment Management Office has expedited and expanded the installation of lighting in business districts to provide streetscape revitalization increase public safety and provide retail support. These funds would allow PMO to continue their neighborhood support work across the city. 
The next item is $118,000 in special appropriation for um, Pioneer Courthouse Square. These are one-time funds to the Pioneer Courthouse Square for expanded security um, to have that security be 24-7 through the fiscal year. For uh, the next item is $200,000 through special appropriations for PCC Future Connect um, as part of Portland Community College's Future Connect program. This one-time funding will support Portland State University in hiring two college success coaches that will assist low-income first-generation Portlanders transferring from PCC to PSU to better their transition, support college completion, and guide career readiness. This program will run from January of 2023 through July of 2025. Uh, the next item is um, $50,000 um, for homelessness support. Um, one time, there are one-time funds to specifically help Family Promise of Metro East, a new affiliate of the National Family Promise Association, organ, I'm sorry, organization, to establish the program and serve families experiencing homelessness in Northeast and Southeast Portland through a community-based volunteer response. Next. Can I, I, I have a question on the, on uh, this one? Can I get some more context on uh, on this? Um, uh, this what are we buying here? I am a little bit familiar with the group that we're talking about. I don't think of them as being a Portland area a service provider. How did this get here? This was uh, through my office, Commissioner Maps, um, and Family Promise actually has been here. Uh, trying to start up a local affiliate over the past several years. Um, they have um, had a, had the ability, they just need to actually set up the infrastructure. And this is actually a very small dollar amount for the return on investment we get from the creating a network of volunteer congregations throughout the city, um, rotating um, uh, housing or giving up their parking lots and extra space uh, to house families on a rotational basis. So it's a it's a definitely a small investment for a huge value add in return uh, for the city. Has this been coordinated with the joint office or any of our uh, other homeless service you, infrastructures? Uh, more con yeah, happy to talk to you about, more about that story, but um, there have been attempts. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Rubio. All right, the next item is $150,000 for literary arts. Um, it will be an allocation to special appropriations. This funding would support literary arts' capital construction campaign for the build out of their new location at 716 Southeast Grand. I have a question on this one. Um, can you remind me how much in the mayor's proposal we have for um, capital improvements? I, capital, I think there's a capital improvement yeah. set aside. Did we zero that out? So, so, so yes, that is a funding source that is is going towards this whole suite of packages. I believe that there's a million dollars for O'Brien Square capital funding. So that is a capital set aside eligible expense, and I, I believe that that is the primary one. Here. But for the most part, we're taking our capital uh, set asides and devoting it towards other sort of direct service-y kinds of things. Is that that's, that's what's happening here? So I guess I wonder, or I'll just, say, I'll talk to my colleagues on this one. Um, and if the sponsor wants to jump into here, they can. You know, at a time when the city's not investing in our own infrastructure as part of the bump, it just strikes me as, um, being surprising that we would um, help this very worthy literary arts group um, complete one of their capital set aside or capital projects. Um, I, I, does anyone want to jump in here on this or provide some context? Yeah, Jillian, uh, my chief of staff will chime in here. Yeah, and I will say literary arts has been at this effort for quite a while now. They are at the very end of their fundraising effort. They just have a little bit more to go. And they are looking for a signal from the city to sort of help bring them across the finish line that this is something that we support and care about. They are one piece of a larger arts and culture ecosystem that is building itself out in inner Southeast Portland. So between them relocating to Southeast Grand, plus the Portland Opera, Milagro Theater, Center for Native Arts and Cultures, OMSI. Um, we think these organizations together will further solidify Southeast Portland as an exciting arts ecosystem. And this is our signal that we support that build out. 
next up, you are going to see the Metropolitan Youth Symphony go after buying the Melody Ballroom to further build out that arts ecosystem. So this is about uh, redevelopment and using arts and culture as um, the economic development tool and just community um, community building that it can become. Well, this sounds like a, um, a great project. Um, I, I guess I don't understand why it's part of the fall bump, though. Um, it's not obvious to me why this is er urgent, unforeseen. Um, our, our third criteria is unable to be absorbed in the Bureau's current year budget. I don't even know what Bureau this would fit into. Um, can someone give me some context as to why this is an appropriate fall bump? So we don't we don't have information on that, but I don't know, Jillian. Would you have anything that you could share around the the, the urgency or timeliness of this? Well, they believe that at this point to sort of get them across the finish line um, as they continue to make the case to private uh, donors that they would love this the city to signal their support of this project. I also want to say that uh, as Jillian's been saying, um, we do need to signal our support of the arts um, economy here in the arts community. Um, not only that, the, the rising cost of infrastructure and development um, and because due to supply chain issues make this, makes this an urgent um, request. Um, it's already been uh, drawn out as long as it is, as possibly could be. So uh, this is a good faith effort for us to support the development that exists in the community um, as well as ensuring that it gets done as cost efficiently as possible. I appreciate those responses. I have no more questions. All right. Um, so the next item is also an allocation to special appropriations. It's for um, something called Every Wednesday Future of Work Implementation. This is working with Venture Portland to implement implement the plans developed regarding the future of work and every Wednesday programming. The next item is, um, and this was a request that came through um, the Bureau at, uh, as part of the fall bump. Um, it is for uh, Portland Parks and Rec, uh, for O'Brien Square capital funding, a um, million dollars is allocated, which would partially reimburse Parks and Recreation with capital construction funds for the previous transfer of 2.2 million in capital construction to PBOT for the demolition of the garage. The funds would be directed towards long-term rebuild of the park at the square. The next item is $190,000 for a mit mitigation bank, which would go to Planning, Sustainability, and Environmental Services. This funding will support a limited-term full-time position to lead the citywide mitigation banking project for one year, as well as provide professional technical services via the development of the East Bank Crescent Prospectus, conducting a carbon capture assessment and assistance if needed with loan applications. The next item is a facility study in partnership with the Housing Bureau. It's um, for Portland Fire and Rescue. It's $200,000 and it's a study to evaluate existing fire stations and facilities in partnership again with the Housing Bureau. Can I get some more context on that? Um, sure. Um, I, 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 let's see. May, I, maybe this is a, a good idea. It's also um, kind of unique. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, so the folks listed as contacts on this one is um, either our fire chief. I Chief, see Bone, chief or... Bone is here. Chief Bone, and, you and want to respond Rob. to that? Yeah, is, is, Molly, uh, is Molly Rogers or Chief Boone on the line? Yeah, hi, Jessica, uh, Sarah Boone, fire chief. Um, good afternoon, uh, council and commissioner Matt. Uh, this is uh, just to update uh, a contract uh, to look at a needs assessment. And there's a, a bigger picture in this as far as it fits into uh, the mayor's overarching um, direction when it comes to looking at sites uh, for uh, houselessness. So this is the redevelopment and looking at the getting in triangle, but at the same time, which is the partnership with housing, but also uh, looking where fire prevention uh, can move uh, to our training sites. So it's just updating um, our needs assessment. Um, let's just say I, I think I would uh, need to learn a little bit more about this proposal before I vote yes. 
Um, so the next item is in the Housing Bureau. It's a public land evaluation for affordable housing and assessment of local regulations on housing costs and production. It's 150,000 that would build a land bank of up to 400 publicly owned sites and assist the impact of city policies and regulations on the cost of building housing. The next item is um, within the impact reduction program within the Office of Management and Finance. It's, it's 3.89 million uh, to continue the current level of service. So due to increased contractor wages, gas prices and dump fees, additional funding is required to continue the existing level of service that is being provided through the impact reduction program throughout the year. The next item is within um, the Street Services Coordination Center of um, within the Office of Management and Finance. It's $150,000 to provide towing support for the Bureau of Transportation's abandoned auto program to increase contract wage price and ensure responsive services across the city. The next item is a million dollars uh, to the Joint Office for Homeless Services. This is a general fund commitment for provider staff wages. It fulfills a commitment the city made in la the last fall bump, fall of 2021, to match county funds for to raise service provider staff wages. And then the next item is um, also within the SSCC, um, Street Services Coordination Center. It's um, $250,000 uh, due to staff shortages at the Portland Police Bureau Central Precinct. This funding will support two limited term employees for private security guards to support the impact reduction program's work. The next item also within SSCC, it's um, $150,000 to fund an additional firefighter to provide support for SSCC navigation workers, first responders, and contract work, contracted workers. The next item is 100. Did I hear you say a firefighter to support SCC? What, what is, what? That, that's, that is the description, Commissioner. Um, I'm wondering if um, Sky or somebody is here. Great. Sky and, and Director Myers are, are here to talk about this proposal. Oh, thank you. Uh, my, my apologies. Um, thank you uh, for the repayment back. Uh, as in similar to this, the same thing we're doing with the, uh, the two individuals that are over there today. So a, a couple of notes. Um, one, we use uh, Portland Fire and Rescue individuals to work with our Street Services Coordination Center out in the streets as they navigate with individuals that we are working with uh, to, to move to shelters. They've been extremely successful. Uh, we've been able to, uh, with the help of the firefighters, they have a unique relationship with the community. They're able to de-escalate issues when we are having these discussions with individuals on the street as we're using navigators to provide opportunities for them to go from the street into uh, provider-led uh, uh, services. Um, the interest now is to expand this project. We have two operating out there today. Uh, we believe asking for a third would be extremely beneficial. Uh, we are using three geographical areas in, in the city. This would mean we would have one working in each geographical area to do this work. Um, so, uh, my apologies, Commissioner Hardesty, if this caught you off guard, as it is a prof uh, professional uh, firefighter within Portland Fire and Rescue. That is the interest of the uh, uh, where we would get this individual. They just have a unique uh, experience and provide a tremendous service out there. Uh, we're very proud of those firefighters, and they've done great work um, out there, and this would be expanding that service. Well, thank you, uh, Director Myers. But let me say, firefighters have a lot of skill sets, and they are overqualified for the work you have them doing. And so, as you know, firefighters are being uh, required to work overtime uh, because of our lack of staffing. And so I am concerned that we are using people that are multi-talented for things that don't require their high level of skill set and now you want to add an additional firefighter uh to that uh that's going to have an impact on staffing levels in the fire it's already having an impact and it will continue to have an impact if we're using firefighters as uh, homeless uh, people removal uh instruments uh thank you commissioner and uh, I see Chief Boone has put a, a camera on. Chief, do you want to weigh in on, were you aware of this proposal? 
no commissioner but that doesn't mean uh a lot of the stuff that they're doing uh when it comes to uh the camp abatements and the street coordination is really um uh interface with the fire marshal's office and so i do know our fire marshal has been working with um the previous assistant fire marshal but i will say i was surprised to hear this and the fact that we can't even maintain frontline services and suppression and so i believe me and director myers can have a conversation as well but it's one of those things that it's not that it's not realistic but at the same time all our resources should be on the front lines um so we're not uh having to uh pay overtime and force firefighters to work um where they're already exhausted yes uh thank you for that and thank you director meyer i mean I, I i appreciate the uh explanation but I, I i would ask in the community safety system are there not other people with the uh, uh customer service skill sets uh like ps3 uh people who i've never seen on the street uh, that could uh, that could actually serve that purpose rather than uh, taking people with these enormous skill sets and 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 putting them in in places that uh, undervalues the resource that they provide. Uh, Commissioner, you you may be correct. I think there are extremely valued employees within the city of Portland that can offer tremendous services in many different ways, including our. Uh, our officers from Portland Police Bureau and, and specifically the PS3s. I will say that um, uh, uh, my understanding is the Community Safety Division SSC Incident Commander was in conversation with the uh, uh, Fire Marshal, Assistant Fire Marshal with uh, Portland Fire and Rescue about this situation. Um, so I'm surprised that this did not resonate to the, uh, or, or uh, elevate to the Fire Chief's um, office. Uh, we will work on that part. Um, I'm not I, surprised at all, I, but I appreciate I, it. <laughs> I, I do believe, uh, and uh, I will say, you know, I have a long history in the fire service, so I, I'm a little biased here, but uh, Portland Fire and Rescue offers a unique opportunity to provide some very, very uh, well-equipped, uh, talented individuals to do this work. I am also very aware of your overtime issue and the ability to staff fire units um, out in the street. That's why we are specifically looking toward the inspector rank rather than the firefighter rank, but we will follow up with the uh, fire chief and do the due diligence necessary to uh, see if this is uh, a staffing opportunity that uh, you all can support. Thank you. Thank you. Because uh, the two firefighters you have are two of our best. And again, we need them back in fire. We don't need them actually out yep. uh, interacting with homeless people. They need to be doing their work in fire. And, and so I understand that, Commissioner, and I, and I support that. I, I think there's a lot of credit in what you say. I, I agree. I will tell you that um, when I talk to individual, and, and I think you can, uh, hopefully you can support this, this theory, and, and, and I think it's beyond theory now, I think we've had a lot of a factual um, change here, the impact of the Street Services Coordination Center on assisting with our houses uh, issues within the city of Portland, uh, I believe have been extremely beneficial to date. They directly impact the, the um, call uh, um, amount, the, the level of calls for uh, Portland Police Bureau, they impact the non-emergency amount of calls for Portland Fire. So I do believe, um, although Portland Fire has a, has a wide variety of calls that they respond to, that we are taking some of this workload um, off the street for them by doing it, handling it a different way. And um, so I would just offer that, that this is not a, a takeaway from Portland Fire and Rescue. I believe we are adding a lot of value back to them. Uh, I believe I've talked to labor uh, within Portland Fire Rescue, uh, uh, and I've talked to Portland Fire themselves, and I do believe that their interest in, in, in solving the houses and is, is issue would be a tremendous benefit to Portland Fire and Rescue. This is one way Portland Fire and Rescue can assist. If, if I may thank be you. so bold, I mean, it, and, and thank you for the, the good description and the explanation. Um, clearly there's a breakdown in communications here with the Fire Bureau, and um, I would want to know that the Chief is comfortable with this before we move forward. Conceptually, it sounds great, but but the chief, um, the chief needs to have a thorough opportunity to look at this over the course Understood. of the next week. So I'd really appreciate it if we could, if we could uh, close that loop. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we're on now to the start of the next, the final page. Um, and so the first item here is a, a hundred and forty thousand dollars to fund an executive assistant to support the community safety division leadership team. Next item is. Um, 
uh, $750,000 to secure private security contracts for surrounding neighborhoods and business districts of designated camping locations. And I should say that the next, um, the, the remaining items I believe are all related to the ordinances, the resolutions rather that you all adopted. Um, and so 750,000 for um, private security contracts. Um, the next item is 4.19 million to um, include, which includes capital costs for three designated camping sites, as well as site preparation and construction costs. Uh, the next item is 12.845 million. Um, this package supports operational costs for three designated camping sites for one year, including provider staff salaries and benefits. Um, and it's this specifically, you'll notice this dollar value is less than the column immediately to the left, and that's because this is funding for the remainder just of this fiscal year, so not a full year's allocation. Uh, can I jump in here? Could you just remind us how much, how many dollars are in our pot? Of, how, how many dollars are available? Uh, so the the total between um, capital set aside and general fund unrestricted contingency is about thirty, a little over thirty million. Um, we will talk about the sources in just a moment. Thank you. These. So um, uh, the second to last item is one point five million to expand staff capacity for the city incident command team operational structure to systematize increased management oversight and strategy related to homeless services. And also this funding has been um, uh, brought down to a level that is just for the remainder of the fiscal year, not a full fiscal year's allocation. And then finally, 3.5 million for 50 person city employee navigation team to increase connection with individuals experiencing homelessness and available services. This item is also funding um, that is scaled for the remainder of the fiscal year, not a full year's allocation. So in total, um, that's $43.6 million. That does exceed the amount of um, available general fund contingency and capital set aside resources. So we are gonna be passing out a um, document that walks through the sources side of how this is balanced. Um, so while so director Kanad, it doesn't feel like we've built in enough time to have a conversation about this. I'm looking at the clock yep. and we're going to be out of time soon. So what is the plan for, uh, because my office was just notified of this stuff on Tuesday. And so uh, we've been talked at for an hour and 45 minutes so far. I'm just curious as to when there's going to be a real conversation about what's being proposed. So I think the time today is to make sure that there is uh, a, the opportunity for a public discussion and public daylighting of, of the proposals and the ideas that are on the table. Um, the council has the opportunity to continue talking about these proposals um, leading up to um, the, the, the ordinance next week. And so we did build in time this week, or uh, we didn't build any in today. So we build them in next week to have a conversation. So the time for the conversation is either today or um, individually, um, or through your chiefs of staff leading up to the ordinance next week. Well, that's not a really good way to do a radically different fall buck. Let me just say that, again, on Tuesday, my office was notified that this was going to be a radically different process. And it seems unfortunate that it seems to be just on a fast track for passage. I know I won't be here next year, but that doesn't mean I don't care about how we end this budget cycle. So Commissioner, and I will just say that it was my decision to also take a decent amount of the time today to talk about the economic outlook and the performance cycle. So I will own that, that part of not allowing a lot of time for these conversations. Can we go ahead and continue with the items? Okay. All right, so in terms of the um, unspent funding sent to the, the joint office, uh, I'm sorry, in terms of the sources, the first item is um, uh, 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 taking $8 million of unspent funding, that, uh, unspent funding that was sent to the joint office. I think that the mayor mentioned this in his uh, talking points. Uh, and then the next item is reallocating. Can I ask a question on that? Sorry, I know we're, we're getting late. Uh, is that $8 million currently programmed for something over in the joint office? 
That's cool. under discussion. Okay. The next item is um, uh, reallocating some funding that was allocated to Prosper Portland for commercial activations and retenanting. So taking back 1.25 million that council adopted as part of an ARPA allocation and reallocating that 1.125 towards these new purposes. And then the last item is to take 3.774 million of funding that is um, was allocated to the Portland Police Bureau, but is anticipated to not be needed this year. It's, um, they are anticipated to have underspending this year. And so this money is grabbing that funding back to again, source uh, some of these other proposals. So you, that, that totals 12.9 million of other sources. When you combine that with the full balance of the capital set aside and the full balance of general fund unrestricted contingency, you get that, 40, that same 43.6 million. It does balance. We'll say that this, this does not leave zero in our contingency accounts. It does leave um, the funding that I had mentioned before, um, that $9 million, four of which is set aside for transition costs, um, but it does leave a balance for um, other urgent and, and um, unforeseen needs throughout this fiscal year. Are there questions on the sources? All right, so um, I'd like to turn now, um, Commissioner Ryan, you had, um, your office had put forward a couple of items. Um, and so um, there is one, um, there's $5 million um, uh, for city um, uh, general fund for emergency rent assistance. Um, so uh, there's a, a request for $5 million in city general funds for emergency rent assistance and program administration costs. The resources will provide rent assistance to prevent evictions for an estimated 1,000 households by June 30th of 2023. The Bureau will work with partners to deploy resources to maximize leveraging of existing resources, equity and access, and expended expediency of expenditure. And then um, also a request um, for um, the Portland Housing Bureau's eviction legal, legal defense program. And um, the request is for $1.8 million in general funds to support um, the evic eviction uh, legal defense program's financial assistance program. This is currently being administered by the United Way of the Columbia Willamette. Through existing ARPA funding, UW has staffing administrative costs for the program covered through uh, June 30th of 2023. So this request does not require the hiring of additional bureau staff capacity. Thank you, Director Kennard. <clears throat> um, as you know, we need to keep people in their homes and there's been, uh, the burn rate's quite high right now to do that and it's only escalating. Um, Karen just came up to the podium, so if you could take it away, Karen. Thank you, Commissioner. Got and Gideon Chapman for the record. This is definitely an urgent, unforeseen set of circumstances where we are unable to absorb this with the Bureau's budget. Pre-pandemic, we were operating a rent assistance program between four and $5 million per year. With that, the demand was so high that only 10% of families were served at that amount. During the pandemic, we saw a large injection of federal funds, which have almost entirely been depleted. It's been a joint effort between the Housing Authority, Home Forward, the County Offices of Community Services and Housing, and our City Portland Housing Bureau. Looking at eviction filing data, today, this afternoon, about two hours ago, we just received the latest filing data through the end of October, minus one business day. We still do not have the data for October 31st, but through the week of October 24th through the 28th. We're seeing higher than ever numbers of eviction filing, and that is why we're bringing this forward for council consideration. I also have Molly Rogers on the line, who's our interim director for the Bureau, if there are any questions. Thank you. I have a question. I have a question also. This is sort of a, I guess this is a process question. I, I, I think the, the mayor's proposals that we saw were balanced. Um, this is coming in. How should we think about, the, uh, 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 about this, especially if we want to pay, pay for it? Uh, so, um, so I think if, if you're starting from a place um, where, with the list that we just walked through, then we would need to identify additional sources to fund these um, or, or, or reduce items from the list that we just walked through in order to fund these requests. 
Good. Can you remind me again, um, what's the total ask for the, is it 1.8 for Ryan's request? It's, it's yeah, a total, it looks like a total of 6.8 million, 6 .8. is that right? 6.8. Plus. Okay. Yes. So. I, I don't have any questions right now. Oh, Commissioner, I, I, for some reason we can't this hear you. The multi uh, I'm sorry, can you not hear me? We can hear you now. Oh, okay. Um, is this for the multis that are going to expire? Is this for anybody who's facing eviction? Uh, how are we, who are we prioritizing and, and how? Yeah, the local jurisdictional partners have put together a prioritization when they were doing the eviction prevention with the federal funding, and Molly can explain that, but it's through a network of partners. So culturally specific community-based organizations are out in the community, folks can access these funds through them. And Molly, if you'd like to provide some details on how those funds have no, been prioritized. I, no, we can get the details later, please. I'm sorry, because we're running out of time and I have questions about uh, some other stuff. Uh, so uh, I, I would appreciate you uh, providing any information to Doug Bradley in my office. Absolutely. Um, but I want to make sure that I, I have some other questions that I need to ask that haven't been answered so far in this conversation today. And so first I wanted to start off by asking if there's a move to take the money that, uh, that was designated for Reimagine Oregon. Um, uh, for most, most of council wasn't here in uh, the summer of 2020 when Mayor Wheeler and Commissioner U Daly committed to investing annually in, uh, in uh, issues that were impacting BIPOC communities. This allocation uh, was uh, started in 2020 um, and because of the mayor's office uh, not actually being engaged is my understanding for a while, the work did not get started. Um, now we've built up a good fund of money um, that is supposed to benefit specifically BIPOC communities. And my understanding is there's a raid taking place on this fund. So I don't know if that's Director Kennard. Uh, I think I'm asking this question too. Can you confirm or deny that there's a move to take those funds and reallocate them to houseless services? So, uh, Commissioner Hartsty, you're, you're talking about Reimagine Oregon, is that correct? That is correct, yes. Okay, so my staff touched base with the Reimagine Oregon team at the Urban League earlier this week. Uh, they're very much interested in moving forward with the use of the cannabis funds for community-focused budgeting. There was some question as to why the funds had not been expended, but we had the conversation. They intend to use the next several months to develop a more specific vision for the work. So they are, you know, the bottom line is they're still relying on the one and a half million dollars in general fund that the city previously committed to yes. providing support to the Reimagine Oregon project overall. They right. have represented to us that they need these funds to ensure that they have the capacity to do the work with the Canopus funds as well as their work uh, overall. So I'd encourage us to uphold these commitments and give the Reimagine Oregon team some more time to stand up the community budgeting process as originally planned. Uh, and uh, my office is obviously available to work with Commissioner Rubio's team to make sure that there's a strong partnership on the city's support. So uh, I, can, I can deny the rumor, <laughs> I guess, is the answer to Thank your you. question. I appreciate that because, yes, community members were very concerned that the city was just once again uh, not keeping a commitment that they've made to the black community. Yeah, and Justice Raji, I see you on the line. I, I think this squares with the conversation that was had with my staff earlier this week. Is that correct? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, that is correct, uh, Mayor Wheeler. And thank you all for yeah. your commitment. Thank, and thank you for being here. Thanks for, for sitting with us for several hours going through the very, very small type. It's good to see you. It's a pleasure. Uh, Mayor, I have a couple of more questions. I know we don't have a lot of time left. Um, I am concerned that if we do not invest in capital set aside, uh, we will be in violation of our ADA ramp settlement agreement. We are required to invest $1.8 million a year uh, in use in capital set aside to actually uh, 
be in compliance with this agreement. My understanding is that your recommendations lacks that investment. Um, and so again, is that true or not? Um, so it, this can be funded. First of all, we, we do need to meet that commitment and that can be funded through the adopted budget. So that's the plan. Uh, thank you very much, appreciate that. And I do wanna say for the record that PBOT and no one else has actually put their capital budget together yet. Uh, because we have not completed the projects that Correct. we're currently working on. Correct. Normally, it would be a couple of months from now before we would have that together. Um, and last but not least, I have a question about fire and fire staffing. Um, I see that the, uh, the, uh, is uh, the fire staffing issue was pulled off the budget yesterday, I mean, off the calendar yesterday. And I want to remind uh, the council uh, that our federal delegation worked hard to get us a safer grant so that we could fully staff Station 23. I understand that we're making priority budget choices in this BUP process, but I will say if we fail our federal delegation by not actually fully funding the request that Portland Fire and Rescue has put into this BUP, um, that we will suffer severe staffing consequences because of those actions. Uh, this, was, uh, this was something that was very thoughtful, which is why we raised our own money to do a staffing study uh, and presented it to council. So uh, I think we're almost out of time, but I wasn't gonna get to say it if I didn't jump in. I'm done. Uh, so it looks like we just have a minute left. Are there any other final points or questions or requests? Our for community budget advisors have been sitting very patiently, and I, I want to make sure if they have something that they want to ask or contribute, they get the opportunity to do so. And we really appreciate your both being here. Thank you. No, I don't have any comment. Thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you. Same. Thank you. And, and when Sho listens, that means he actually has lots of thoughts, and I, I guarantee you he's been taking copious notes and he's going to share them with us. So thank you for that. Really appreciate your presence. All right. So uh, does that complete the presentation? It does. All right. Very good. Uh, well, then thank you to the City Budget Office and Director Kennard for guiding us through today's work session, to Bureau and Council Office staff who made themselves available to answer questions, and to my colleagues, of course, for engaging in this discussion, as well as our community budget advisors. This package will come to the Council next Thursday, November 17th at 2 p.m. I look forward to finalizing a fall bump package that funds improvements to our government structure, supports daily services, and addresses our toughest problems. Thank you all, and with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>